Hello, Chicago, and this is Chicago Sports Podcast. You guys are joining the Monsters of the Madhouse. I am your host, Brandon DuPlacy, joined by co-host Kyle DuPlacy. How are you feeling, Kyle? Good, man. How are you guys doing? Good. Also joined by Brian. How are you feeling, Brian? I feel great, man. Brian, good to very great of his burst talk. Pronounce your last name for me, man. I've never actually said it. It's LB. It's like just like LB. an L and a B. You just second okay. L silent in it, so it just pronounced like LB. All right, Brian, I'm excited to have you on. It's been a long time since we've done a show, and I am very excited, guys, to announce a special guest because he's usually in our chat and usually killing it in our chat. That is Paul from Bearski Films. Paul, how are you feeling tonight? Good, man, good. This is how, how you know what kind of person I am. I totally read that as edible, Brian edible. Yeah, I, get that. <laughs> I was like, oh, man, LB for sure. Nice. Yeah, yeah Paul, no, I'm doing tell us, great. Tell us a little bit about where we can find you for your content. Yeah, just youtube.com slash at Bearski Film. Um, you know, also on Twitter. I don't do really well on Twitter, just mainly on YouTube. But uh, yeah, lots of highlight videos, hype videos, do uh, weekly shows during the season. And then during the offseason, we kind of take a little step back. But yeah, all that content's on there, just youtube.com slash at Bearski Film. Okay, and while we're, while we're discussing the chat, guys, I'm going to mention we already have a few in here. Ant Moss, Cliff, Bruce, what's going on, guys? Uh, Philip. He's here. He's back. So uh, much, much love to these fellows that are that are already waiting and anticipating to talk about this subject that I think has been probably the, the news headline of today in Chicago sports. And that is Adam Schefter raised the red flag over Caleb Williams not signing a contract. He also did discuss Roma Dunze as well. There's only five first round draft picks that are left unsigned from the 2024 draft guys. And Caleb Williams and Roma Dunze are two of them. Although, I, and I'm going to say this to all the fans out there that are kind of running around like chickens with their heads cut off. Adam Schefter's message was a little more to me than a red flag was a little more kind of relax. Everybody, these deals will get done. So I'm going to go ahead and start with you, Paul. How do you feel about the fact that Caleb Williams and Roma Dunze are still left unsigned? Uh, I'm, I'm still fine. Um, yeah. J- just got to wait it out a little bit longer. You know, the only, I'll actually start being a little bit worried if it does make it, you know, towards training camp because yep. then these guys can't participate. Right. So you don't want any setbacks, your rookie or anything like that. So, um, you know, it, it's going to get done all, all this stuff. It's just, the negotiations are happening. It's not like he's, you know, threatening to sit or anything like that. So I, I think it's just taking a little bit longer than usual, but you know, a little bit longer than usual. I think the bears are known to usually have these guys sign pretty quickly. I remember in years past, it's like a week after the draft, everybody signed. So it's, it's an orthodox. It's definitely an orthodox. It's something we're not used to, but uh, on a worry scale, I'm still down there at two, you know, I'm not really worried about it, but. Yeah. I think that's the general consensus for most Chicago fans. Brian, how do you feel about the fact that Caleb still hasn't signed, which I think we all kind of projected, right? Yeah, I'm not too worried about it either. Um, it, there's really no point in them bringing them in if they're going to show up for uh, training camp next week anyway. Um, it, it could be just a ploy for them to, you know, sign on hard knocks. Um, you know, I, I've gone over various things over it myself, and I, I'm just not worried about it at all. I mean, like just the rookie cap is what it is. I mean, it was collective bargaining. The only thing they can argue is the language. I mean, so it's like how much you're going to get fined here if you do this stuff. How much you can – I mean, th- th- there's not a whole lot that they can negotiate on. I mean, so, I mean, it is it is what it is. I mean, th- those two guys, they're not going to miss any time really. I mean, because they seem to all be all about practicing at this point in their career. So they need to get – they want to get in there. So I think that's exactly what they're going to do. Kyle, I know you've hammered this subject out a little bit on this podcast previously, so I know you have a little a, a little intel for the fans out there listening today, like why you think, and I know Mike Florio listed three reasons on why he believes these guys haven't yet signed. So tell us a little bit about the reasoning behind Caleb Williams and Roma Dunze not yet signing their contracts. Yeah, so basically when it comes to rookie contracts, the contract, the total of the totality of the contract is going to be decided no matter what. It's already decided. Mm-hmm. What they're discussing right now is basically guarantees the signing bonus when they pay the signing bonus, how much, and injury stipulations. Besides that, everything, the Caleb Williams will be playing for the Chicago Bears week one. Roma Dunze will be playing for the Chicago Bears week one. This is nothing to be concerned about. 
We've seen this happen more and more. It's been more and more common in the recent years, and it's going to be an ongoing pattern going into the future. I mean, these Caleb Williams, of all people, is the, the person who I expected this from the most. He said it coming into the draft. He's not just learning how to be an NFL quarterback. He's learning how to be a businessman, and he's proving that right now. And when it comes to the Chicago Bears in particular, Ryan Poles is very smart with his money, and he's going to drag this out as long as he can to save every single dollar. This is going to be something we're going to see going into the future more and more often. Yeah, and I, I agree, especially with players who have as much leverage as Caleb Williams has. I mean, let's be honest, you know, I'm happy he's a bear, but this is a guy who made $10 million in college plus, right? So, I mean, he's, I mean, he was living on his own in high school. He's aware of what he's worth, and that makes you kind of a little more confident in the way he feels about who he's going to be in the NFL. And I am going to real quickly go over what Mike Florio said in regards to three reasons why these two rookies might not sign their deals. Signing bonus cash flow is first. He says, how much of the signing bonus is paid up front? How much is deferred? And for how long? So that is one thing, guys, that Florio thinks is just, like you said, Kyle, the contract, where, where the money lies, right? Where in the four years is money paid? Is, is it, you know, front heavy? Yeah, not forth. so much how much is more as when he's getting, getting yeah. paid the bonus. The voiding of guarantees, what it will take to let a team wipe out the remaining guarantees. So this is something that, that – Florio said that I really kind of, and Kyle, you've mentioned this before, something that really I honed in on. There have been issues in the past about suspensions for certain on-field interactions opening the door to erasing guaranteed monies. Players want to limit the team's ability to unguaranteed guaranteed cash. So that kind of, I mean, it's laid out. And I, I respect Mike Florio. He's always got a lot of, like, as far as I'm concerned, he's, he's always pretty spot on. But um Erasing. In, in, in regards to that situation, they're talking about personal team rules, not NFL rules. So if the well, NFL is rule in place that if you get a DUI, you lose a certain amount of guarantees, you're suspended yeah. without pay for two games, yeah. it, that can't be changed. Well, I, I don't want to think about. I want. I want to. I want to break this down a little bit. The team's ability to unguarantee guaranteed money. So if there's clauses, guys, in a rookie contract about guarantees. What does the word guarantee mean, right? I mean, that means that there is no ability to tell a player they will not receive this money. And I have no doubt that Caleb Williams is trying to hash – Caleb Williams and, and his team are trying to hash that out, right? Like, if it's guaranteed, that means I get it. That's that's, And I don't blame a player for doing that at all. And I think a lot of these – a lot of these clauses in rookie contracts came from the NFLPA, actually, from veteran players who didn't want to see rookie rookie players on their teams collecting, you know, majority of money over the guys who have been there for longer. So, And then the last thing Mike Foria said is guaranteed offsets. If the player is released with guaranteed money left, this is probably not something that Caleb Williams and Roma Dunes are talking about. We're not talking much well, about this. This, this is when you're getting into injury, injury stipulations. Yeah. That's what this is in regards to. The player prefers to double dip. The team wants to get credit for the salary and a new NFL franchise. Okay. So I, I don't think, I would imagine that last one guaranteed offsets is not something that's being heavily discussed, but discussed between the Bears, Caleb Williams, and Roma Dunze. But Paul, how do you feel about, about the three signing bonus cash flow, the voiding of guarantees and guaranteed offsets? How do you feel? these three are playing a factor in the discussions they're having with Caleb Williams. Well, it, you know, it's kind of like you were saying, uh, money that's supposed to, supposed to be guaranteed, that's not guaranteed. I mean, I think a lot of the times we forget that, you know, because we watch these guys on TV, we idolize them. This is a job. Like, this is a job that comes with a paycheck and a certain level of expectation for me to run my life the way I want to run my life, right? So if I'm expecting to get a certain kind of paycheck – and then, you know, I do something wrong at work and that money's taken out of that. Yeah, I would feel a certain way about it. So I can see why why that's an issue that, you know, can be they want to kind of argue and stand behind. And, um, you know, although I do think these things are more minor um, uh, details when it comes to the overall big picture. Um, and like you mentioned kind of earlier with Ryan Poles and how we're probably going to be seeing this more often. I mean, Ryan Poles has actually kind of been known to, I think, be a pretty tough negotiator. You know, we saw him come in here and like the first guy, I think that got a contract from the other regime was Cole Komet. And even that came, you know, after a while, but you know, the Roquan Smith thing, he didn't really budge there. Yeah, that's not ugly, yeah. And even with Jalen Johnson at the end of the day, I kind of felt like that was the exact contract that I thought he was going to get. 
Like I felt he was worth 16 million a year due to the situation. He got to overpay him a little bit, 18 million a year, but to, but to go out there and make him like the number one paid corner would kind of be uh, overpaying. And that whole thing kind of dragged out for a while too. Uh, if you guys remember, there was a lot of talks on, you know, if, if Jalen Johnson was even going to get signed. So yeah, um, I think, I think Caleb's definitely getting uh, a lesson in business. Like you said, he's going to have to be a pretty good businessman to sit there and negotiate for the things he wants. Yeah, Brian, let me ask you, we can harp on Caleb Williams all day because I, I think we can all agree, guys, we knew when this player was drafted, there was, there was going to be a prolonging of this process. We knew he was not going to be one of the first first round picks to sign his contract. Brian, do you think that Roma Dunze is an issue? Because that's not a guy I really expected to see any kind of hesitation from regards to signing his rookie deal. I really don't. Honestly, um, I wholeheartedly believe that they're waiting for the hard knocks thing as far as that goes. I, I think that's already done. I think they're just waiting for him to get in camp so he can sign. Because uh, Bears typically, they don't sign players unless they're already there. They don't bring them in specifically for that and then send them back off and then bring them back in three days later for camp. So that, uh, I typically just, I mean, Roma Dunze, I think his, he's just waiting. I mean, ser seriously. I mean, there's nothing else to that he can do i mean there's no really wide receiver you know suspension things going on that, that that's one of them things unless you're talking about the off all field things like kyle was bringing up earlier so i mean roma dunes they should be pretty cut and dry caleb williams though however um you're not going to find your quarterback i mean you don't want him to miss any or miss any time anyway so his guarantees um they they should be locked in, honestly. Um, his is probably just like the language. Like, I'm a real estate agent myself, and we fight over language all the time in every contract that we write. I mean, like, language is a big deal. So, I, I mean, I wholeheartedly believe that Caleb Williams is just language. He's going to get all his whole contract. is going to be guaranteed because I think Jaden Daniels is. So, you can't guarantee Jaden Daniels with, you know, even if it's a different organization, he's the number two pick. You can't, you have to do that for the number one, <laughs> you know. So, yeah. um, I, I believe their whole contracts are going to be guaranteed. It's just a matter of when they're going to get their money. And real real quick, Brian, um, as far as like a business decision goes, what would make the most money here would be to wait and do it on hard knocks. It I would. mean, it financially, would. that's what makes the most sense. So I, I could definitely see, you know, the cogs that turn behind the wheel. Man, if they want to make more money, that could be really what it is for sure. Yeah, I think the rookies yeah. would report on the 16th. So that's probably when they're going to get their deals done. At least Roman dudes say yeah. And you've both made great points, Brian, to your point, you know, from your experience in real estate is the wording of a contract might be what Dale has a bigger issue with than the money itself. Yeah. It's like Kyle said, there is a cap. Like rookies can only make so much, right? But I, I, I would imagine that Caleb Williams wants to hash out, like I said, I would imagine it's the, the unguaranteed money that's the biggest deal for these guys. Mm -hmm. And then to Paul's point, great point is like, I mean, there's these, these guys – especially a guy like Caleb, these guys come in here and, and they know, you know, they're, they're drafted. They're not going to, like you said, Brian, they're not going to miss time. They're not, you know, this is not going to be an issue when the season starts, this deal is going to get done. And Caleb knows that. And that's even more leverage, leverage for a guy who was drafted first overall. Right. So um, you have to imagine that Caleb is just having, I would imagine like lawyers look over contracts and decide what's best for him. And I don't blame the guy for doing that at all. Um, yeah, I would be shocked if the verbal's already said. They just haven't signed. Yeah, and a lot of it, a lot of it, a lot of it, what they're working out right now are, are the team rules and, and the and the consequences for breaking those rules. So, for instance, like like Paul was saying, if one of us, if if Brennan or I, I'm a bartender, Brennan works warehouse. If one of us doesn't show up for three days or shows up late three days in a row, they can just mm -hmm. fire us, right? Well, if Caleb Williams doesn't show up to practice on time three days in a row, the chances of him getting cut off the team are about zero point zero 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 zero. So, the best way to make himself hold himself accountable or be more responsible is to attack, the, go after their money. That's what these guys care about the most. I mean, like Paul said, this is a job. Ultimately, this is a job. It may not be the most prototypical typical job, but it's a job. So, what they're doing is making sure they're talking about what, what what they can take away from their guarantees based off of what their for actions they've or rules they've team rules they've broken or the actions they've done this that's all it's all coming to, down to that now like i said this we've seen this more and more often in the recent years we don't obviously for bears fans it's recent memory is 
I believe both Roquan Smith and Jaquan Brisker did something similar to this, but we all knew that it was going to be amplified with Caleb Williams. I mean, he's, he's the star of the show. He's the, probably the biggest signing that Chicago Bears have had in the last 20 years. And he's a businessman. Like I said, at this point, he's basically his own acting agent. Yeah. And I mean, in regards to what Paul said, in regards to um, Jalen Johnson and Roquan Smith, is we've gotten kind of two mixed signals from Ryan Poles. You know, you had a guy in Roquan Smith that did his job and did it well, and he ended up probably being a top three linebacker in the NFL when he went to, to Baltimore. I believe that he is. I would call him that. And Ryan Poles didn't decide to, to retain him, but then you had a guy like Jalen Johnson who the Bears kind of said prove it to, and he did get paid. I do want to go over this comment, guys, from Ant Moss. It said, Rome hasn't signed either. It's not a huge deal, only for a chef to make drama. I don't know if you guys have actually heard. I'm sure all four of us here have heard what Adam Schefter said. He didn't really spin it that way. Uh, from what I heard, they played it on Cap and Hood this morning. From what I heard is he said these deals are going to get done. They're going to get done. Yeah. These guys are just, you know, they're they're looking at the options they have in regards to the, the ability to make money and make it early. And I, I don't blame, I guess, I'm going to keep saying this because I don't blame the rookies for doing this. This is going to be something you're going to see more often. Paul, do you think that this is this is just going to be a – a top 10 pick thing moving forward, or this is going to be something that you start to see guys do on a regular basis? Well, um, so you mentioned there's still five first round picks that are unsigned, right? Two of them on the bears. Well, two of them are on another team, both of Washington or um, both of uh, the Vikings picks. Yeah. have not signed JJ McCarthy and, and, and the, um, I forgot who they drafted, Dallas Turner. Look it up, but Dallas yeah, Turner. Dallas Turner, neither of them have signed. So th this isn't that it's, this is a front office, Mm -hmm. dealing with their players thing is what it is and um you know it's so funny man uh, the nfl is such a powerhouse when it comes to this stuff oh real quick uh, before i before i say that I, I just wanted to kind of answer your uh Roquan smith thing a little bit too because at the end of the day different positions have different values right like there's a reason why quarterbacks make well, the outside line you know, 20 30 million a year versus running backs or somebody else making a lot less. And so I think when you have that value set for a position and you have a player, and even though he's excellent, but he's disagreeing with you on the value that you have set for that position, I think that's kind of what happened there more than anything. It's not that Roquan's not worth the money. It's just he's not worth the money in this situation. Right, and there, there is, there's a standard to each position and what the league – kind of delegates to that. So and Roquan was looking for more than the league has paid to that position. So I, I don't yeah. I don't and we got two quality linebackers out of saving that money. So I, I don't I, I don't disagree. Poles has done a pretty good job financially with this roster. I feel like um I he sent a message to the team with Jalen Johnson. The the coaches challenged Jalen Johnson before the season started to get interceptions, you know, to to take the ball away and he did it. And Poles rewarded him. And that kind of says to everybody else on this team, like especially guys like Braxton Jones, guys who are trying to be that guy. Like if if you do, man, you're gonna you're gonna stay here in Chicago and you're gonna get paid well for it. Guys, I do want to go over this comment real quick. Cliff says Caleb's agent maybe the things may be saying things like, "How many sponsor contracts can Caleb get with your help?" As far as I was, as far as I've read. Caleb is representing basically himself, isn't he? Yes, he is. He is. He's getting financial advice, but he is his own agent. He's he his own acting agent. Commercials, I think, right through this year. I don't think he's getting endorsements for the year. I think he said he's going to come in practicing on football, and then uh, next year he'll start with the endorsements. Yeah, I wouldn't surprise yeah, me I'm, if that changes. But yeah, that's yeah. The, from the last. The last thing that I heard was that he was focused on football. You know, guys, from like my experience with just the, the videos I make, that's the only real dealing I ever have with the NFL. And so, like, none of us are sitting there as agents or lawyers or anything in these contract rooms. Um, as far as just general experience, Brian might have the most out of all of us just doing it for, for what he does with his career in real estate and everything. But um, I know from just making my videos, there's that statement at the end or at the beginning of all the football games. Uh, what, any use of this content? Yeah, the, the, it's the, prohibited uh, and blah 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 and it's like okay so that's cute you can say that but it's not legal <laughs> if it was then why the then, then wgn news or abc news can be giving you their report of how the game went and be showing you their little clips on on the tv channel right so there are common license laws that apply 
And like the NFL says that because that's how they operate. They're such a powerhouse and they have such an upper hand in all this. And that's why you were saying um, Caleb is represented just by not NFLPA certified because that NFLPA certified means you know how this works. And so you work within a certain set of rules, but like Caleb's lawyers may find some legal, legal issues in this. It's right. not <laughs> cut and dry. They just kind of, you know, do what they want all the time. And it's not always right. And I could see why, you know, there's probably some details that he's got problems with or issues with. So, yeah, they do want to give a shout out guys to Elizabeth. She says, Hey guys, bear down heart, heart <laughs> in blue and orange. <laughs> so, um, Ch Cheryl's giving us the updates as usual guys, white sacks and twins both won a game today. White Sox and Twins. She seen, she seen, the Cubs won a game today. I know that. Twins won second game. No, oh, no. It was oh, a doubleheader. Double the White yeah. Sox and, and well, The White Sox beat, beat the Twins for the first time in 18 games, I believe, right? Is that not – is it something, something like that? It's 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 an outrageous stretch. It's, it's been no been like two, that, that's, been, that's, their, that's their World Series. It's been like two years <laughs> since they've beaten that team. Um, and, guys, I want to give, give a shout-out to our first – Sponsor that is Bridges Scoreboard is your Northwest Indiana Chicago sports headquarters with a Hall of Fame menu and the coldest beer in Chicago. And guys, get out Chicago to get out to Bridges Scoreboard if you guys are in the Indiana. It's like the Griffith, Indiana area if you guys are out there. Um, and then right across the street after you have some dinner, some wings, some beer, check out uh, Serendipity Ice Cream, Serendis Serendipity Ice Cream Power today and discover what delicious summertime tastes tastes like. Serendipity is serving up heaven. Um, we they recommend the delectable funnel cake Sunday, guys. I know I say this day in and day out, and you guys probably get tired of hearing, but if you haven't gone to Serendipity, I'm going to just keep saying it to you guys. Go check out Serendipity on 120 North Griffith Boulevard in Indiana. Um, I do want to like, – the contract thing is obviously something that everybody's interested in. I, I really think all four of us can agree it's, it's not something we have a whole lot of concern over, right? I, I don't think that we expect Caleb Williams to miss any time in training camp. We don't expect Roma Dunes to miss any time. I think I do think the Rome deal gets done before the Caleb deal. I do think I I honestly projected and I, I said it on this podcast. I think Caleb is the last first round rookie to sign a contract. I do believe that that's the case. It's not like a worldly projection because he's the first overall pick. So I it doesn't surprise me at all what's going on right now, guys. It's, I mean, is there anybody in this panel that feels like this wasn't something we all kind of expected to happen? Oh yeah, I expected. You hear a lot of. Uh chatter i guess or slander as far as uh cable williams goes everybody hears that uh that stuff that just people make up on you know social media and stuff like that like he was wanting ownership and stuff like that's just ludicrous wow. <laughs> you know i mean that's collective bargaining you can't handle it i was like everybody wants it but nobody can get it <laughs> yeah. you know i think aaron uh, Rodgers tried that previously too and it was something the nfl said can't be done it's just not right. an option so they're right and i that was a comment they, from a really long they probably time. told rogers to go buy some right. stock <laughs> right. <laughs> so we went about the box. <laughs> yeah. The Roma Dunes, I think, is is a little more surprising to me. Not concerning, still not concerning. A little more surprising to me. He was the ninth overall pick in the draft. He probably could have gone a little higher than that. I was surprised that he was there at nine. Um, and I'm wondering if maybe because he does have a good relationship with Caleb Williams already, is this a little bit influenced? I would imagine if Caleb Williams wasn't drafted first overall to the Bears and wasn't holding out on a deal, Roma Dunze would probably already be signed. Who's the fifth player that has not signed? Um, I know Marvin Harrison signed. Offensive I, I, tackle from Mabel the bang, Bengals, Amarius Mims. Oh, out of Georgia. Who, who I really liked and I really thought the Bears would look at if, if they didn't. If they decided to trade back, that was the guy that I actually wanted the Bears to take, Marius Mims. Um, really good player, solid player, and I think he'll be a wrecking ball for, for Joe Burrow and those guys. But, uh, yeah, so five players total, two on the Vikings, like we said, Dallas Turner, JJ, what the hell is McCarthy doing? But um, I don't want to beat this up too much, guys. Are we all in agreement that maybe within the next coming days we're going to see both these guys sign to a contract? At some point. Does anybody here think that either one of these guys is going to miss time? No. no. I think no they but that's the only way you start panicking, you know? If it, if yeah. it gets to that point, then it's... And as much as I think, I am not an Adam Schefter fan, but when I hear him say, relax, it's not a big deal, it makes me feel a little better. The guy knows... I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying that 
Adam Schefter is making stuff up to, to, to create a story, but there is some validity to what the comment earlier that this is the NFL off season. There's nothing to talk about these, you know, for basketball, just ended, hockey, just ended. these guys are just looking for something to talk about. And right now in the NFL, this is probably the most exciting story they could find. <laughs> yeah. These guys ain't holding out. I mean, if they sit out and decide not to sign, well, they go wait next year and go in the draft again. I mean, they, <laughs> that's just not going to happen. I mean, Crabtree's got the farthest when he missed seven games, <laughs> something like that. But I mean, that, it's just not going to happen. I mean, these guys, they know where their money is. Uh, you know, and this well, they, is make more, they make more playing football than they don't, right? Exactly. And this is this is a new regime, and right, it's, as far as I can tell, by all accounts, Ryan Poles seems like he's got a good head on his shoulders, and he's going to find a way to get this done. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, Chicago you know, Sports Podcast guys, which is Brandon Trax, um, the CEO of and founder of Chicago Sports Podcast, says didn't Roquan sign his rookie deal in week five ish? The language he argued was over penalty money for tackling certain ways, etc. Um, there's there's a lot of factors that play into it, guys, when you're talking about clauses. Clauses are probably the biggest issue rookies have signing deals. It's not necessarily with the money because we all know they're only going to get so much. It is the clauses. Like Brian said earlier, when dealing with real estate, it's the language, the language that somebody uses. And you have to have your lawyers. Like every, every, every rookie is probably going to have a lawyer look at this stuff and make sure that they're getting what they're owed, right? Yeah, you essentially well, fight over protection is what you're fighting over you gotta protect your money protect your investment i mean that's that's pretty much all the language is saying you just um what verbiage you like and you know which way you want to work it go ahead paul yeah you know uh part of the thing is too um like brian said he's in real estate um when i bought my house my real estate agent was my a friend of mine and she the seller we we knew each other she was their real estate agent too so she said, let me back out and you guys could just save the money or like or we could pay somebody we know the money now to, to have it be a rule that like I have to hire this person or I have to have an agent or something like that. That's why these players represent themselves like Rokon. I, I believe it's a family member of his that acts in that role that might get. A, a little bit of sl- a small slice of the pie. You know what I mean? So these guys just want that dollar to go to them or, you know, or places where they choose. And, you know, I just think in general, uh, I love the conversation of financials in the NFL, because to me, it always amazes me. I always feel like it's kind of like the second half of the game that's kind of done behind the doors, but it really do. It truly does matter. I mean, we've seen the bears here dig themselves into some financial holes. I mean, I remember Lamar Houston and Pernell McPhee. We signed those guys for a lot of money that did not pan out and they created, you know, it helped create, a pretty big financial hole that took, I think, John Fox two, three years to dig out of. Um, one thing I always kind of go back on, and it was kind of like a, a kick in the ass for me, is when Robbie Gold was up for his contract. I was looking at the situation going, well, yeah, you know, we have a team ahead of us now that's going to win five games a season at most. Like, we're not, we're starting to rebuild here. What do we need a top money kicker for? I love Robbie does not make sense to pay him four or five million a year. You know what I mean? And then he went and the rebuild happened a little bit faster than we expected. And in 2018, they're competing. And what do yeah, they need? A, a damn kicker. Up. And, and on, I, on the road there, they signed giraffe neck, Mike <laughs> Glennon, for $16 million, which you could have easily allocated to Robbie Gold and kept him here for three years, even though it wasn't worth it. One of the things, the things that the Patriots were always able to do is have a premier kicker. And when Tom Brady would sit there with Bill Belichick, who is the acting GM for or was the acting GM in those situations, I mean, you best believe that there was an understanding of financials and how you spend that money. And that's why Tom Brady didn't take max deals left and right. He left more money on the table so they could afford things like a max kicker. So there is a way to do things financially when building a team that's really interesting. And, and you know, you need the players to be on board. And when I was looking at Justin Fields, that's one of the things that started kind of becoming clear it's like man no this would have had to gone in a path where there had to be so much success that he would have been okay getting even paid less but no we're looking at more of a daniel jones type deal and you best believe that that guy's gonna try and take every dollar of it so that's the other thing i hope with caleb too it's like with all this being said and everything okay i'm more interested in even like four or five years down the line what that type of situation is going to well, look like when he comes to the table to negotiate, because hopefully he's smart right. enough to, to he's gonna take look, a he's step gonna back. Get, he's going to get the $39 million. He's the first overall pick. That is what he's the, a four year, $39 million deal, right? That's, 
That's what Caleb Williams is. That's the projection. It's the yeah, status it's quo option. for the first overall pick in the NFL, quarterback in the NFL. I think it, I believe it's at $39 million. It's just, like I said, he's probably hashing out a little more. When is the contract paid? It's more, more of it paid up front. When it, like, I'm sure he's discussing, like Kyle said, the unguarantees the NFL has given themselves the ability to do, which is. I got a question for you guys. Do you think that this year is the best team Caleb Williams will have? Because some of these contracts do start coming up, like DJ Moore and, you know, Keenan Allen's on a one year deal, you know, or maybe I know we still have a handful of picks for next year. So maybe next year is the best team he has. But then after well, that, there's got to be a drop off because you're not going to be able to pay everybody. I, it, it, makes the think of a, it makes me think of a, of a if K Williams is the guy that K Williams is projected to be, how much does it matter? It's like I, I think of Patrick Mahomes, and I don't want to keep like none of us want to keep doing this, but like he lost Tyree Kill, they retained Travis Kelsey, they paid Kelsey, and and K Williams or I'm mean, sorry, um, Patrick Mahomes has won a few more Super Bowls, so it's like how good is I think how good Williams will be will dictate how much they require skilled players getting big deals, right? Because the way the NFL is going, especially these receivers are getting astronomical figures. And if let's say even DJ Moore, if Caleb Williams is the player we project him to be, Keenan Allen's probably gone next year. And then I would imagine if DJ Moore comes out asking for $130 million, I don't know if they'll do that either. If they feel like they're good with Roma Dunes and they can go draft the next guy in. If Caleb Williams is that guy, if he's that Patrick Mahomes type player, do they want to keep giving veteran players big deals or they want to just keep trying their luck with drafting young talent and seeing if the guy that Caleb can get it done with those guys. Kyle, what do you think about that? I mean, I agree hundred percent. I mean, ultimately it's all up to Caleb Williams. If Caleb Williams is the type of player that makes the players around him better, like you could, I mean, like I, you said, I don't, I don't like comparing him to Patrick Mahomes, but that's a perfect situation to compare it to. I mean, we, they lost Tyreek Hill. We're all like, oh man, it's going to be a couple, it's going to take a couple of years to recover from this, you know. And then there's Patrick Mahomes who goes and wins two more Super Bowls. I mean, this is, if Caleb Williams is that caliber of player, then you can let these guys like Keenan Allen and DJ Moore walk as long as you're drafting well and you're drafting weapons or often early. But if he's not that guy, if he's more of kind of just a really good player who kind of de- depends on a really good team around him, kind of like, you know, maybe Jalen Hurts or or a Brock Purdy situation where they have to load the, the team with talent in order to get to the championship, then I would fully expect them to re-sign DJ Moore or or draft nothing but receivers, tight ends, and running backs in the first three rounds of the next three years of drafting. But like, you know, like Pascal said, they have a lot of draft capital next year. I'm not really too concerned about that right now. My main concern is obviously just the development of Caleb Williams. Yeah, I mean, I agree. I, th- I think the uh, receivers are the best that he's ever going to have. I mean, he's uh, – but I don't know what the overall team is. I think they're actually going to get better next year uh, when they start moving some stuff around. Um, I don't anticipate them re-signing Keenan Allen. I know he's uh, he's going to be good. I mean, even if he, you know, goes out there and gets, you know, 16 touchdowns this year, I still don't think they're going to re-sign him. I just think he's too old for – you know, it's not – it's the way Ryan Pace or Ryan Poles operates. He – doesn't get a whole lot of uh, seasoned <laughs> veterans. And the fact that they even signed somebody with the age of Keenan Allen was kind of shocking to me. But uh, um, I guess was it was a trade, the, the, too. So he isn't, what's it? He was a trade, too. So he paid out a, a part was, of his main yeah. deal. But yeah, yeah was, well, he, Brian, he Poles does not have a history of signing guys who are over the age of 30. He hasn't no, signed he does. For big deals. I think he's but got I, three, a pretty high confidence in his ability to draft him. He either signs 22 year olds or he signs 40 year olds. Yeah, so I mean, you're just not going to replace Keenan Allen with anybody that's Keenan Allen. So, <laughs> it's, um, I, I, but I do believe they'll get an edge rusher, probably a better edge rusher than they can ever fill that hole with this year. Uh, they'll probably get one next year, is my anticipation. So, I think the overall team will be better next year, but the wide receiving core, not so much. And guys, yeah, and this is why it's an interesting question because, like, like I said, the team, Russell Wilson is probably the. Uh, best example of this that I like to use because it's like, okay, he gets there. He's on his rookie deal. They got this great defense. They got a strong running game. He's got a lot of help, you know, and when it comes time to pay him and he takes all that money, I mean, even with DK Metcalf, even with Tyler Lockett, even with weapons, that defense is what went away. And now it's all on your shoulders. I think the NFL has set a standard of paying these guys like they're Peyton Manning when nobody has been Peyton Manning since Peyton Manning, right? And so, like we saw, that's it, it, a great point. With it is all on Caleb too. It is, and I love 
the Kansas City reference because I, I don't care that it's Patrick Mahomes. That is what – that is – I want the best, and I want to be better than the best, so that's what I'm going to use as a reference because we got to do better than them. Tyreek Hill was great on paper for them. They drafted that guy in the fifth round. Mm-hmm. You said they lost him. No, but man, they got two first-round picks and didn't have to pay him. They used, they, they took yeah. – they won Super Bowls with him, utilized him. Up. Yeah? The Russell Wilson – Russell Wilson, I personally, I, I was a big Russell Wilson fan. I personally think that Russell Wilson's career kind of dipped after injury, not so much age or so much losing pieces on the roster. Right. Nobody's he just, his, 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 his didn't off, he go nine years straight? offensive line became one of the worst but in the NFL. Just, he, hurt, he, broke, he broke that finger on the throwing hand, and after that, when he came back after the rehab, and, and you guys, if you remember that injury, we were initially told it was a four- to six-week injury. Russell Wilson came back after two weeks, and I thought it wasn't appropriate what the Seahawks did trying to make the playoffs, and, and it really affected how he played for the rest of it since the day he returned. It really hasn't been the same Russell Wilson. So I think he kind of had that Robert Williams – or not Robert – sorry, Robert Griffin deal. Like with the but injury. those are two different timelines. He, he went nine years straight as being a pretty mobile quarterback without missing a game. So yeah, I think yeah. when that happened, it was already 2021. This is already years after getting paid. Uh, it, the, the, the moment I'm talking about is five years into his career when he's won Super Bowls, and then after that, he didn't win again. And I think the financials kind of, you know, point, um, told a certain story there. And, and so like, you know, you said quarterbacks that make the receivers better. We saw that with Tom Brady. He took Deion branch twice at different points in his career. And in that middle, Deion branch wasn't very good, but when he was with Tom Brady, he was pretty good. And on top of it, he took less money. And if Caleb Williams is chasing Tom Brady and chasing those multiple rings and this and that, this is going to be a huge part of the process to be able to sit there and do that. But in 2019, Russell Wilson threw 4,000 yards, 31 touchdowns, five interceptions. So it's not like after he received the money, he stopped being the MVP. I think that was actually the year he won MVP was 2019. And I think the year after he was injured was the year where we started to really question if Russ Wilson was the player that he was paid to be. But I think that he still was. I think it was the injury. That, and I, I agree with you, Paul, I do. I think that the contracts that these guys are getting, it's, it's ungodly. It really is. The receivers and quarterbacks, I mean, they're, they're going to take up 25% of your cap, and it's almost guaranteed. Like, look at the money that Amon Ra just got in, in Detroit. And Jared Goff's probably going to – think about the money. Let's think about Jared Goff's contract. Jared Goff is getting pretty old, right? I mean, what was where was Jared Goff drafted? He's like where? 36. He's like 36. Yeah, he was 30, what, 35, he was, I think. He was drafted, like, 2015. It's like 2015. Yeah, first overall to the Rams, 20, 2015. Or is he so, 34 years old? He's probably going to get an over $100 million deal, deal from Detroit to retain him, which, like, well, he already is, did. They already paid him. Oh, was he? Is he is he signed? He's extended from Detroit? Okay. What was Detroit. the deal? $250 million? This can't be right. Goff is 29. Yeah, I was gonna say he's not in his thirty. I don't think he's in his. Oh 30. man, I'm way off. My bad. Yeah. Wow, I I I, I think yeah, I believe you... the year he the year he went to the Super Bowl against the Patriots, I believe, was his second year in the NFL. Yeah, he came back, right? What's that? Yeah, but, he I mean, you look, at, you look at money like that, and you just that's just what it is now. That's what these guys like, and, and, and even like look at Trevor Lawrence, that guy who who also just got paid. Trevor Lawrence, who's who's really like. He's been good, and I'm a big Trevor Lawrence fan. You guys know that. I'm big, I, I like. I watch the Jaguars when I'm not watching the Bears. He's been good. He hasn't been great. That's just the standard. If you don't pay these guys, you're going to lose them. So let, let's say Caleb Williams plays as good as Trevor Lawrence. The Bears are probably going to give him a, a, a $200 million contract. That's probably what's going to happen. And and I, I so do I think, Paul, when you ask that question, do I think that this Bears team, is this the best Bears team he's probably going to play with? Probably. Probably because – You've got a lot of guys that are going to need some contracts on this team, and and I mean because pretty responsible. We continue to talk about how every year a new quarterback or a new wide receiver or a new defensive end, whatever, resets the market. Well, mm-hmm. the Bears, if the Bears were smart, if they if they believe that Caleb Williams is the guy within the first two three years of of retain of having him as the Bears quarterback, then they what yeah. I would do if I were them was sign kind of a, a Patrick Mahomes contract. 
do the, mm-hmm. the ten year five hundred million because ultimately Patrick Mahomes is not getting paid what he deserves to get paid if you compare him to the rest of the NFL. He may go down as one of the top three quarterbacks ever to play football, and he's what fifth, sixth on the list. So that's the when you when you do those long term contracts, as long as you know he's the guy, you can. It, it doesn't matter how much the market is reset; he's locked into that contract. There's nothing he can do. I mean, if the Bears were smart, the, and Ryan Poles, I think would probably lean that way because like we said we've talked about this he's very smart with managing his money i think he would probably lean that way if they do honestly believe that caleb williams is the next best thing in the nfl they would be better off within before the year four begins the last year of the contract before the fifth year option i would extend him to a long-term contract and then by the time all these guys reset the market after him he's still going to be getting paid less than those guys Right, absolutely. Yeah, I don't think Tom Brady was ever paid what he was worth either. But I believe a lot of that was his wife. Well, Paul, yeah, Paul's right. It's he was he was he he took less money to yeah. to ensure that they put a good team around him, which is very smart because he he won seven Super yeah. Bowls. Yeah, right. And and like it's interesting because the year they had Randy Moss, and they went all in on the offense. Man, they were dominant, but they didn't mm-hmm. win a ring. They won the ring when the money's more. When, you got to be able to win in different ways. You know what I mean. And, and the Patriots shown that year after year after year, example after example. They'd even do it week to week. Whereas most teams have a game plan, they would adjust their game plan. That's why you'd see these no name running backs come in and have a four touchdown game. I don't know where. Why? Because this is the best plan we have to attack. You know whatever their defensive weakness is, and they were so flexible with all that stuff. But in order to do that, you got to be real good. You yeah, gotta Paul, have players I, I, that fit from spots and pay them. Yeah, pay them. I, accordingly. I agree. That when, you're right. When the Patriots, the Patriots were at their best when the money was spread out, and particularly with the, the position they always seemed to focus on was not offense. It was actually cornerback that the Patriots seemed to go out there and get the, the best of. And it's that's that's what we've talked about on this podcast time and time again, right, guys? Like these these teams, like the Patriots and Packers, who are a revolving door of young talent. And they don't pay a bunch of guys. They let guys walk in free agency. These are the guys who have sustained success. Now, you have teams like the Eagles right now and the Niners right now who are really good teams. And they have, they're have they going to have an opportunity to win a Super Bowl here. But the window is much smaller than when you spread the money out like that. Because once once you get locked locked into long, long-term contracts like that of Cleo Mack, that's when your team starts to really struggle because if Cleo Mack's not pulling his weight, which we saw due to injury or other various issues, then the team does not play well. And that's just you, you don't have enough money to to address, put more talent on the rest of the roster. So once you lose those one, two, three guys that you've paid, you're in trouble. You're an average football team. Yeah, Joey Bosa has been killing the yeah. Chargers. Guys, yeah, real quick, I want to give a shout out to El Bandito Tequila. As we all know, Chris Chelios is part owner of the Tequila. Um, they have um, in Yeho, Reposado, and Blanco. Guys, if you want a good margarita um, or just tequila on the straight, straight on the rocks, you guys know me. That's my poison. Um, go go buy yourself a bottle of El Bandito tequila today. I also do want to give a shout out, guys. I didn't realize it was it's Andre Dawson or the Hawk, most most well known by Chicago fans. It is his birthday today, guys. So happy birthday to Andre Dawson, who I believe Trax has actually had on the show before as well. Oh, guys, I do I do want to move on from the the contract negotiations between Caleb Ramadunze and the Bears. I do want to move on a little bit to. ESPN released Caleb Williams' projections, and I've seen a lot of projections, a lot based from A, gambling sites, or B, fantasy sites. Um, ESPN's is probably the most, I don't know, down-to-earth. I, I, that's a term, I guess, is appropriate to use. They have 3,538 yards, 23 touchdowns. 13 interceptions and a passer rating of under 90 at 89.1. How did, do they you give you, did they give you rushing stats? Does they, do they have rushing stats on there? No, it's just as a passer, strictly as a passer. How do you feel about that, Paul? Um, extremely realistic, in my opinion. Um, I could totally, totally see it going that way. And even if it does, Still, it's the Bears rookie record in passing yards, right? Yeah. I think. I think when I look at this team and how it's constructed, I'm really interested. And I know, I know this kind of gets a little slack, um, a little shit from some people here and there. But th- this punter, man, if if he can do what he's supposed to do, I think that might be a little bit underrated. Because if you're putting the defense in good positions, I mean, 
for Christ's sake, they made shirts in Iowa that said punting is winning because he'd pin the teams back. They'd go three and out because their defense is in a great situation. And so like, man, 3,500 yards, depending like, especially in that type of thing, if you're starting midfield all the time and whatever, that could actually wind up being a great season with those type of statistics. So, you know, those stats are a lot easier to add up when, you have the whole field ahead of you and things like that. So I'm actually kind of interested to see because, yeah, numbers are numbers. You can have them tell any kind of story you want. And like I said, those I could totally see it playing out with those type of numbers at the end of the day. Um, for me, it, I, I try and just, man, I want double the TDs that I have INTs. Like for me, that's usually a thing. At least get a two to one ratio going. So if you have 13 interceptions, get, like throw me 25, 26 touchdowns. That'd be nice. You know what I mean? Um, 3,500 yards. Yeah, it would be the best Bears rookie quarterback we've ever had here. So, but 3,500 yards is where I, it's probably where I have the biggest issue. I think, I don't know. Like, this is obviously a team that established the run last year. Justin Fields was a big part of that. Caleb Williams can run the ball. He's not going to run as much as Justin. We hope he doesn't. But he has three targets that are potential thousand yard receivers and i know i'm jumping the gun on this with roma dunze but he is projected by all measures to be a number one receiver the yards is probably where i have the biggest issue i i eric kramer has been told by cliff here guys in the comments eric kramer holds the record with 38 38 3838 yards i do think caleb williams breaks that record as a rookie in yards i i do i think he throws a lot of yards that's where my biggest issue falls with this the CSPN predict, prediction. The touchdowns and interceptions I could see. I, I, I'm, a, I'm with you, Paul. I don't 25 touchdowns seems very plausible to me with, with the targets he has on this team. Um, 89 passer rating, not not a bad statistic for a rookie quarterback. But the yards I do have an issue with. I think he'll be somewhere close to 4,000. Um, Kyle, how do you feel about these projections? Well, I mean, so we all know what ESPN does. First of all, the, the, most of this is they, they use an algorithm to figure this stuff out based off of statistics from school and, and his team and the, the time he has to throw it. By. But in the long run, I mean, obviously what I think they would do is they would take, you know, his ceiling, what they would consider. So let's say they say it's 4,000 yards passing and then his floor, which is 3,000 yards passing, and then they find themselves somewhere in the middle. But, I mean, to be honest with you, I would, I would, this touchdowns are actually what surprised me. I would I would put that closer to 30 for sure. And that's just because, like you just said, Vernon, I mean, they've got DJ Moore, Roma Dunze, Keenan Allen, uh, Cole Komet, DeAndre Swift, Roshan Johnson, Gerald Everett. I mean, these guys can we, – we all – I think we all agree that Cole Komet's probably good for six to seven touchdowns. Mm -hmm. DJ Moore's good for six to seven touchdowns. Keenan Allen's good for six to seven touchdowns. Roma Dunze should get a couple. Tyler Scott probably get a couple. You know, Gerald Everett will probably get a couple. DeAndre Swift will probably get a couple. I mean, I expect closer to 30 touchdowns. I would, my, my personal, it was, and we're not too far, I'm not too far off from ESPN. My personal projections would be somewhere around 3,800 yards, 29 touchdowns, and probably 12, 13, 14 picks somewhere in there. But, you know, like I said, this is, they're just taking what they believe is probably his exact average. They don't want to go too high and they don't want to go too low. But if I was a betting man and I was on FanDuel or DraftKings, I'd take the over on both the yards and the touchdowns. Brian, how do you feel about those? Uh, like you said, I mean, I agree with you as far as the uh, – or you and Kyle, as far as the uh, yards go, uh, I think that's low. Uh, Shane Waldron, I don't think he's had, like, a collaborative effort of under 3,800 yards since he's been a OC in any facet. I mean, I think, like, last year, I think uh, Geno Smith had 31 and – Drew Locke had like 700 something, you know, so I mean, it, I just don't see him going under 3,800. I think that is where the bar, you know, that that's the over under for me. Uh, I definitely think it's going to be over. Um, as far as the um, the other stats, uh, I'd like to him for him to set every Bears uh, record, uh, but the rookie record that I'm really focused on is the 11 wins. Um, I don't know if Caleb actually cares as long as he gets <laughs> he gets them wins. Um, he doesn't. Yeah, neither do we, right? Neither he do doesn't we. seem like a guy that really cares about stats. He, he just. Um, as far as uh, last year goes, as far as in college, where they start out like six and zero or whatever, and then one like one game in their last five or six or something like that, he just looked deflated at the end of it. It's like at, at some point your team's got to you know 
progress and get better. And I think his team let him down. If he's just winning, I think he's happy. Yeah, I agree. And just to all of us Bears fans who have endured misery for the last couple of decades, we just want to see some victories, guys. We want Caleb Williams to win games. I do agree. But I, I, I think with winning is just going to come mm-hmm. a, a modern-day offense, right? I mean, that's what we're all expecting right. is a modern offense. And, and that that comes with with passing the ball, guys, which we haven't seen here in a long time. I am going to – because. Bearski did this for us, guys. Paul did this for us. We are going to hash out a little bit of this. Um, the salary cap hits for for quarterbacks year by year. We're going to, we're yeah. going to start with the year that I thought was. I mean, look at look at the names on this list, right? Um, yeah. So, like, if I could talk about it a little bit. Um, yeah, so, what yeah, what I did was pretty much just took the top ten paid quarterbacks. And um, I did this for 10 years in a row. We're not going to show all 10, but I just kind of want to show you at least the first and the last one to show you what kind of uh, difference has happened over the last 10 years. So what it is, is in 2014, the cap was 133 million. So even though Rogers was getting paid 22 million, that team is still willing to sacrifice 16 and a half percent of the total cap towards that starting quarterback position. Right. Now the, the interesting thing in 2014 and throughout, you know, some of the earlier years, um, and I did a full video about this on my channel too, for people who want to check it out. So, but um, it, it's, it's that there's the shift because like in this year, you look at all these names and these are guys who are either competing for a Super Bowl or have had a Super Bowl. I mean, Rogers has had a Super Bowl. Ryan was in a Super Bowl. Eli had a couple of rings. Flacco got his ring. Breeze has his ring. Manning has his ring. Kaepernick was in a Super Bowl. Roethlisberger, you know, Cutler. And it's, not until you get to the bottom two that, you know what I mean? It actually kind of makes sense. Whereas if you want to pull up the 2024 one real quick and, and so the cap grows every year, right? So in 2024, the cap was 255 million and a guy like Deshaun Watson took up 25% of his team's cap and then was hurt throughout a chunk of the year. A guy like Dak Prescott, you know, Matt Stafford, he, he belongs right up there, but then, Kyler Murray, Daniel Jones, we're talking about four out of five guys that have no business being paid top five quarterback money if we're look if we're comparing it to the same landscape that it was 10 years ago. You know what I mean? And it, then Mahomes comes in there, and you guys talked about that Mahomes deal and how it panned out. Yeah, look at that. He is six on the list, and this is according to cap hits. So although when he signed, it was so much and this and that, because they strung that contract out over a long period of time, like you said, by the time it all catches up, you wind up actually getting a pretty good deal for Patrick Mahomes. And I've found that year to year when I looked at this, it was never the top guy getting paid who was the guy that was winning. It's kind of gone, gone away from that a little bit. The average, it stayed somewhat consistent, but then this last year it shot up. Uh, and this is just the top 10, like I said. I didn't do every quarterback, but um, top 10 paid. But, yeah, it's, it's very interesting how much some of this stuff does affect the way teams actually wind up performing at the end of the year. Like, you know, the Browns right now might have one of the best defenses in the league. I mean, they had guys – they had a no name in there throwing 300 yard games and they had Joe Flacco coming in there and still trying to perform. But like at the end of the day, you're paying your one guy, all that money. And in the long run, it's not going to work out for you. You know what I mean? You can't, can't keep doing that year after year. So I don't know. It's just something interesting that I found and uh, that I kind of put some numbers together on. So yeah, no, we like you and and sure. you're absolutely correct. Cause like, look at, look at some of the names towards the, bottom of this list let's focus on that so Mahomes is sixth and obviously I would hope the panel agrees by any measure the best player not just quarterback player in the NFL I I think but then you've got Allen third to last and Burrow second to last I mean these are young guys Lamar Jackson playing it yeah Lamar who just won a a, his second MVP right and these these are the guys Playing at the top of their game, they're young guys. They're playing their best football, and these are the guys getting taking the the least amount of hit out of the top ten player, the top ten quarterbacks this year on their salary cap. So you're absolutely right, man. I mean, and this is what I was talking about. This is just what the market's going to require. I mean, the Sean Watson thing, we all kind of I mean, did everybody not scoff at that a little bit when that when that trade and sign happened. I, I, yeah, somebody's got to protect them low teams from you know uh, from themselves. I mean, that was just a desperation move. Yeah, the, yeah the, and last thing I want to just kind of say about all this is in the 10 years that I did this, Tom Brady's name as a top 10 paid quarterback or a top 10 cap hit 
appeared once on the list. Yeah. And it was the year he went to Tampa, his first year in Tampa, when they, the Patriots told him, go somewhere else, get your money. Yeah. And even yeah. then, he was like the fifth or sixth guy. Like, he never financially crippled his team. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and I'm going to say this, guys, regardless, you know, if, if Caleb Williams is, is you know, in, in the Josh Allen, Patrick Mahomes, Joe Burrow conversation, or if he's in the Kyler Murray, Jared Goff conversation, he's, he's probably going to be somewhere – Close to twenty five percent of his his team salary. I'm I'm just gonna guess that now. I really believe that, and I, we know Ryan Poles doesn't just throw money away. But like Kyle said, if there's a belief that this is your answer for the long term future, the way this league is going, you know, you see that in 2024 the average is 16 million. But I would imagine just to 2025 that average is going to raise greatly, and it raises every year. It's going to raise again, and by the time Caleb's do a contract. I would imagine that average is much higher, somewhere between eight, 18 and a half and 20, probably. So this is yeah. what it is, guys. It's, it's getting I, crazy. And the receivers are like, I don't even know anymore if I, you know, people are talking about drafting Romadunze with Keenan Allen and, and DJ Moore on the team. And like, you have to. You, you really and, to and, and, and Brandon, I, and, and I, yeah, I exactly with that. Like, I really didn't want that to happen. I really did not want a wide receiver at number nine. I, I almost didn't even care who it was. I would have much rather dropped back yeah, and take the defensive player, right? So but but then, but now, but now, in the aftermath, watching all these wide receivers sign contracts, I totally agree with what you were saying earlier, where, like, uh, the smart thing to do here may be to draft and move on, draft and move on, draft and move on. I I, I love DJ Moore. I don't know if I'm gonna want to pay him. <laughs> not yeah. not with the way yeah. this landscape's shaping out. Yeah. So I'm starting to understand that move a little bit play. more. Yeah, I'm starting to understand that that move a little bit more, even though I disagreed with it at the time, just because the, the wide receiver contracts are nuts. Yeah, mm. when Amon Ra just got paid. I mean, it doesn't sh it doesn't shock me it doesn't surprise me at all but it's just like man a receiver it's like is there a guy out there in the draft that's that's as good as this guy I don't know you know and then it's how much we were just talking about 16 percent being well, the average you, you, you would, you would, these GMs should be signing contracts according to the money they have for certain years so for instance like we just saw Deshaun Watson's going to be accounting for about 25 percent of his team salary cap but that contract could be all backloaded. Like last year, he may have made $2 million. Mm -hmm. You know, we've seen that in sports before. So if you know for a fact in 2026, seven, you're going to have to pay Caleb Williams, then you would front load DJ Moore's contract extension. So that that way, when Caleb Williams is due for a contract extension, DJ Moore's money has basically already been paid. Yeah, and you're paying him what you would pay an average when NFL wide receiver. The money, when, is the, when is the player really hit your cap? And like you said, man, Deshaun Watson's taking up 24% of his team salary cap. And we heard all year, right, when the Browns were making the playoffs, how often did we hear, like, oh, this is the team with the most money on IR, right? We heard that all year long. This is the team with the most money on IR, Nick Chubb, Chubb and, and Deshaun right. Watson was out, and all these guys on IR. But it was like, well, yeah, really, if you just take the one player out of IR, <laughs> it's it's pretty much Deshaun Watson's the IR, right? That's the salary that's an IR is Deshaun well, Watson. Well, and I believe his contract is fully guaranteed, which that, that I mean, the Browns just browned it up and did what they always do. That was that was a terrible contract. I mean, I, and to be all honest, I don't think the teams that they think they were bargaining against, I don't think they were as interested as Deshaun Watson is the Browns believed they were. I think they kind of stuck themselves in a corner by doing that. Yeah. And they, and they did, they did, you know, after they lost Watson and lost the players, the major players, there were salary hits for them this year. They, they still made it to the playoffs. They still had a successful season. We watched. The no, I, I, I agree with Paul hundred percent. I mean, it's, it, unless, unless you know, you have the next patch bombs, you, you can see how the, how that could destroy a team. I mean, Paul's a hundred percent right. The Browns could have been, would have done just well, fine with, in the name, with Joe in the Black name, all year let's, last year. Let's bring up the name that that bothers us all the like. Hopefully, bothers us all the most. This one bothers me the most, and he was injured as well. On top of, you know, Deshaun was Daniel Brian, Jones took I, up eighteen percent. Eighteen percent of Daniel Jones takes eighteen percent of his team's salary cap. That is egregious. Almost I mean, nineteen percent. Like, 
Brian, I, I, I can see you have something to say constantly. Like, I, I want to hear your thoughts. Well, um, I, I just really, we're talking about that Deshaun Watson thing. Um, at some point, you got to, I know, understand quarterbacks are extremely hard to get. Chicago has been, you know, the poster boy for not being able to find one for years. But at some point, your GM has to trust his draft process. It's like, look, I'm not paying anybody $63 million. I can, you know, I trust in myself enough to draft somebody. You know, I mean, Deshaun Watson essentially has had one good year. I think it was 4,500 yards or something like that. It was a stellar year by far. Um, but um, I, I just really hate that they're like, you know, pushing, you know, one team – throws a desperation move that sets the market and then every other team has to jump over that and beat that it's just getting disgusting um i don't know when the next collective bargaining agreement is but that's really something the nfl should really evaluate i mean oh, the, own, the it, owners hated the browns owners that, they did yeah. they hated yeah. them for making oh, that yeah, they, they that right. oh, and, yeah. oh, and, yeah. you know it's yeah. interesting it's like um, last time I was on with you guys, my co-host wound up watching that full episode. And, you know, it was when the DeMar DeRozan news broke. So while talking to him today, we actually started talking a little bit of basketball. And he's like, you know, it's funny to me because he's a huge Bulls guy, right? And, and he's like, 30 out of 32 teams in the NBA want to win. And then there's two teams, and the Bulls are one of them, that just want to make money, sell well, seats, sell jerseys. Yeah, uh, yeah, my bad. I don't, I don't know. I don't watch NBA. But – um. But then he told me, he's like, you know, sometimes I feel the Bears are kind of like that in the NFL. Mm -hmm. And, like, yeah, some teams definitely are. Like, you, uh, as long as the Browns still made money this year, they might be happy. <laughs> but, <laughs> but not, you're not going to win with that, though. You know what I mean? Like, Jay Hood defined that best. He said there's two types of owners. There's, there's businessmen and there's sports fans. And that's uh, the Chicago Bears – Ownership to me is business, all business. You know, they sell out seats. That's what's in the Bulls as well. He's got in, in the White yeah, Sox as well, which is funny because they don't even sell. And it's but, not like you have to dig and claw and scratch to figure out who it is. I mean, you can tell that Tom Ricketts is more focused on the business side of baseball and the New York Yankees owner is more, con Tom Ricketts more, gave more, his manager more concerned about it. the baseball team itself and their record. And I think smart owners know that winning championships makes you more money. That's the, the problem is... The, the real problem with guys like Jerry Reinsdorf is just how small-minded they can be. Like, man, if the Bulls and White Sox were winning championships year after year and doing what the Bulls were in doing the in the 90s game, now, you're, you're, half the amount of money they'd be Bulls making. Yeah. What's you're that? Still, like, half the nation is Bulls fans. you still got the, the, the guys, the old-timers from the 80s that, that lived the Michael Jordan days that still cheer for this Bulls team. And yeah, the that's, Bulls why, that's, why why no, that's why there's no – that's why there's no – base. Guys, I'm not, I'm not from this country. I'm, I'm, I was born in Poland, and I came here when I was six. And when I came here, I knew two things about America. I knew Michael Jackson, and I knew Michael Jordan. <laughs> God, I mean, that reached out to a six-year-old on the other side of the globe. Right? Yeah. Right? Yeah. And then the Bulls won three more while I was here after that. I came in 94. All I knew growing up was we are the champions by Queen, because that's all I fucking heard every year. Like... It, man, that in itself is so valuable on a global level. Like Michael Jordan, his name was just huge. It was gigantic. And so, yeah, just like just like Tom Brady's name will be gigantic. If you want to make the best business decision here, it's not about taking my team's cap, <laughs> the most cap space you can up year after year. Look at the long run here. You take a little less money. You got to be an orthodox in these situations because we're like, I'm looking at this going, man, there's just some owners out there, GMs out there that don't know what the hell they're doing. I don't know if you guys know, like the situation in Houston, I believe I was told it's like their owner is uh, a very devout Christian. And they used to have a priest that would come in the halftime and give speeches at halftime. I believe he made that guy team president. Like, so some of these organizations are ran in an insane way. And so there are some situations where these players are just like, you know what? Give me my money. That's what I'm going to get from this place. If I'm on the Panthers right now and I see David Tapper, I don't know if you guys saw this video or not. He had his wife yeah, giving him insights yeah. during the draft yeah. Yeah. who yeah. they should take because yeah. he's some rich guy with a football team, right? And so, like, man, thank. that's why I love Ryan Poles. 
I love the process, everything like that. Whatever the let the McCaskies keep making money. They'll never their goal will not change, but it just nope. feels like GM down at least now. Like even with Kevin Warren as like we have some people in place now that want this thing steered right and done right and built right. And it's you know, it's crazy because I've been more hyped in other years, but I'm not as hyped this year. I, I feel a little more confident though. I just feel a little more confident that this thing is where it needs to be. Yeah, no, I feel good about our GM, and that's that's not normal for us. Right? Like it's it's different, and it feels I, to me in the NFL, especially, you've got to have a plan before you have the pieces. And the Bears have always kind of done that the other way around, right? I mean, like there was no plan in place for Justin Fields. Like the hiring of Matt Nagy and the drafting of Justin Fields, it didn't not none of it made sense. It didn't nothing I don't, I don't know. They never really develop a scheme and then draft the players that fit it. They always just kind of I don't know. It's just like they take a bunch of different pieces from a def, bunch of different puzzles and try to put them all in together. And it never it never fucking worked, guys. It never worked. And you're absolutely right, Paul. Ryan Poles sees this. He sees the game in a completely different way. And you're absolutely right about McCaskey. And I don't know, maybe it was the firing of um, Ted Phillips. They just, it doesn't seem like McCaskey's hand is so far in the cookie jar anymore, right? Well, I mean, it's, it's, it's sad to think of, but I don't think there's a Bears fan in the world that was like, oh, my God. The McCaskies are so smart. They've 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 somehow learned how to how to how to run a football organization. And they hired Ryan Poles. <laughs> I think what happened is they went through managed GM 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 and finally got lucky and a good one fell in their lap. And unfortunately, well, I think that's probably more I likely like the Kevin case. Warren. I like the hire of Kevin Warren as well. I know a lot of people have gotten down. Well, on Kevin remember Warren. that was done after Ryan well, Poles. Poles hired Kevin Warren, which is the most in, ironic a, in, a, in a nutshell. Yeah, it, it's it's sad. But yeah. it's like what the Colts did. Like uh, Jim Ursay is known to be a terrible owner. I mean, this guy yeah. made Perfect. Jeff Perfect. Saturday his head coach out of nowhere, probably because they were at the bar together. <laughs> oh, <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like the, the situation for that to happen because Jeff Saturday had no business doing it. But like, but Jim Ursay is known to be a terrible owner. He's known to have, you know, uh, just. You have to win despite of him. And yeah, he, once he got Bill Polian and Bill Polian got Peyton Manning, everything seemed to be just fine with Jim Irsay there. <laughs> you know what I mean? And it wasn't until both of those guys were gone that you started seeing some more stories pop up about him and stuff like that. So, yeah, I mean, listen, it, it ownership is an obstacle, in my opinion, that can be overcome. That's why I was always like, OK, people that want the McCaskies to sell and this and that, it's like, great, but it's not going to happen. Um, un unless they're going to get a boatload of money because kind of that's what they're about. You're right. They're, they're just all business oriented and this and that. However, that does not mean you cannot hire the right people. We just need to hire the damn right people. I think we yeah. finally have. Yeah, it, just, it just took 25 years to do so. And then a, list, a lesson that I think, I don't know when and where it happened, guys, but it, it's, you know, it wasn't about not only just about hiring the right people, but then after you do that, trust the process. Trust those guys to do their damn job. Stop reaching your hands into their pockets and telling them what to do. And and it felt like this is the first time with the hiring of Ryan Poles where McCaskey and he did hire Eberflus. McCaskey did hire Eberflus. And once he well, actually, him, ironically, it was it was it was Bill Polian who basically hired Matt Eberflus. McCaskey paid Bill Polian. But it feels like now McCaskey's. I don't know if you know something just hit him in the face, man. But it feels like now he understands. Like I've got this guy that I hired that I can trust and I'm going to stay the hell out of his way. And I, you have, to, you have to think that I Ryan think they Poles, have their hands full with the stadium thing, man. I really, yeah. Do. Yeah. And which is why I think Kevin Warren was heavily, I think that's Kevin Warren's going to be a huge. That is up. why Kevin Warren was brought here. Yeah. But I, I also think that Ryan Poles might've said something like, dude, let me do it. Just leave me like, let me, leave me be like, if you trust me, you trust me enough to hire me, trust me enough to put this team in the right. Well, that, that was probably part of the stipulation before he signed. I think ultimately he was like, you can sign me, but if you do, let me tell you exactly how this is going to go before even, I mean, you guys remember Ryan Poles called the bears. What was that Monday morning and said, I, I'm going to interview my second interview with the Minnesota Vikings tomorrow. If you guys want me to be your, your GM, sign me today. Because if I go there tomorrow, I'm going to sign with the Vikings. And he did. He, they signed him that day. They signed Ryan Poles that day. 
You know, guys, I used to make the joke that, like, the reason why they signed Ryan Poles and Matt Eberflus is because on the offices right outside of them, you only have to replace half the nameplate. Yeah, Ryan and Matt, we're already there. Saves you about $12. Let's do it. (laughs) Um, Guys, I want to give a shout-out real quick to Chicagoland's most delicious and fun sports dining experience, the River Street Tavern, head to River Street, located at 102 River Street in East Dundee, open on Tuesdays through Sunday. They are closed Mondays, guys. They have $2 burgers on Wednesdays. Where are you going to find a deal like that? Not even a McDonald's. And half price wings on Sundays, guys. We also know somebody who tends bar there. That is the man you see in front of you, Kyle. Um, Kyle, go up and give a shout out to the people at River Street Tavern that made this a sponsor for us that help us do this week in and week out. Yeah, shout out to the owners of River Street Tavern in East Dundee, 102 North River Street. Uh, Tina Anton and Lauren Ratner are the two owners there. It's a great restaurant, it's a great location. And uh, they always have great specials and great prices. On, on, and like Brennan said, on Wednesdays, $2 burgers. Sundays, half-price wings. And Tuesdays, half-price tacos. So go, if, you're, if you're in the area, guys, go check it out. Man, I'm not oh. even in the area, but I might have to drive up there and see you guys for sure. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll take care of you, Paul. There's, Paul, if you come out, man, let me know. Let me know. Um, I'm a little bit further. I'm, Kyle's pretty close there. He works there. Obviously, I'm about half an hour away. But if you come out this way, let me know, man. I also want to give a shout-out, guys, to Worth Stadium Club. Um, we're stadium club guys with really, really good cocktail menu. I've said this time and time again. Again, you're probably getting, again, you're probably getting tired of hearing it, but go get yourself a cocktail. Um, if you're if you're a gambler, there's a lot of gaming there. Um, gamble responsibly, obviously, guys. Let's move on to something else, guys, that I want to hash out real quick because I saw this pop up today. I didn't actually know this, and I mentioned it before on the podcast, but we didn't really get to dive into it. The Chicago Bears. Hold on, I've got, I've got, I've got this saved here. The Chicago Bears finished second in the NFL in rushing yards per game or rushing yards total last season with two twenty three ninety nine behind only the Ravens. Now the Ravens and Bears kind of have a sim, had a, had a similarity in regards to quarterbacks last year, right? They had two quarterbacks that could both rush the ball. We don't have Justin Fields anymore. We do have a mobile quarterback, but a guy who said it himself. I prefer not to run. I hate to run the ball is actually his words on Mike on the Colin Coward show. Where do we project the Bears in regards to rushing yards, total rushing yard rankings by the end of 2024? Right. You know, real quick, no, I just had these numbers pulled up because I wanted to mention this earlier. And so I'm, I'm not going to give you a total or anything like that. But when it comes to the difference between rushing yards with a mobile quarterback and rushing yards without one, so I just kind of pulled it up and, and looked. And it's like, okay, so the Raiders games, guys, we had 173 rushing yards without a mobile quarterback. Yep. Now, it, it, no, they, ran the ball well. all around. That? they ran the ball well all around. That was, wasn't that the game Deontay Foreman went off? Yeah, but but you had Tyson Bajan in there. Yeah. That was the, yeah so that was the without game. the mobile quarterback, you're still able to put up 173. And then, you know, during the Chargers game, you put up 73. But then the Saints game, 156, and the Panthers game, 133. And when that happened, I kind of made this point where, like, okay, so it's great we have a, a quarterback that can rush, but if your total rushing yards stay the same and you have a quarterback that doesn't rush – that means you're probably being more effective, right? So I just kind of wanted to point that out, that like even without a mobile quarterback, the Bears still put up three out of four games, over 100 rushing yards total. So it's yeah, not like this team is not only, capable. They are. Fields only had 660 rushing yards. So it's not like like the season where he had a, a 1143, right? The 2022 season, guys, where we saw him almost break the record and he didn't miss a game he probably would have. But he didn't run the ball off the charts last year. And Caleb Williams is – a guy who will run the ball if that's the last option he has. Do we still see the Bears finishing? And I, I, I really hate the total rushing yards versus rushing yards per game. Do we still see the Bears finishing as a top five unit? I don't see it. Um, I think uh, of Caleb Williams' rushing attack, like uh, about like Patrick Mahomes. Uh, he's probably good for about 30, 38 yards, somewhere in that range of game. So in that aspect, you're probably looking at, you know, a little almost 500 yards or something like that for the season, assuming he stays healthy, um, which is not too far off from what you just said Justin Fields got, but he missed, what, four games last year. Um, uh, but I do believe that uh, the running backs are going to go a lot farther because they're going to, you know, throw it a little bit more because Caleb Williams is a little bit more able to do that than Fields was. Um, I'm probably going to get blasted for that, <laughs> but he's, uh, um, 
I, I just I think the the less they run, the more they're comfortable they are with. Caleb Williams. So I think if we actually back off from that a little bit, it's actually a good sign for the Bears. Well, Dustin Jones says something, guys, I want to quote here. Then this is, this is, I, I feel, I felt this way a little bit too, guys, when the signing was made. The Bears were the first people on the free agent board with the signing of DeAndre Swift. The Bears running backs are the biggest weakness of their offense. I think if you dive deep into Swift's numbers from last year, you'll see he was a big beneficiary of the offensive line, which we know the Eagles, I think, were second ranked behind the Lions last year. It, DeAndre Swift did have some concerning numbers, expectancy numbers. Actually, had a negative expectancy yard care expectancy yard number. But I do think if you're going to have a rookie quarterback early and often, you want to get a running game established for him to feel a little more comfortable. So, Kyle, what do you think the impact from Justin Fields to Caleb Williams has on the Bears being a top five rushing unit in the NFL? Well, I mean, first of all, to go back to Paul's point, you know, they he said with games of Tyson Bajan, the Bears ran well. And then obviously Justin Fields, they ran well. I mean, it's probably a little bit different for the Baltimore Ravens, but I think in the Bears' case, the reason they ran the ball so well is because they didn't trust the quarterbacks, and whether that be Tyson Bajan or Justin Fields. And to the latter, the, uh, Tyson Bajan, probably more likely because he's a rookie, not because I think he's some terrible quarterback, but... I think the Bears ran the ball a lot is what they did. I think that's why it just kind of skews the numbers a little bit and puts the Bears in the top five. I do not think they're going to finish in the top five in rushing this year. I think Kale Williams, like like Brian said, is going to have a lot of pedestrian runs is what I call them, where, you know, you, you feel like he hasn't ran at all, and then you look up at the end of the game, all of a sudden he's got 40 yards rushing. You're like, oh, where did that come from? It's going to be kind of that situation. But, I mean, I, to, to Dustin's point, I do think – that DeAndre Swift is overrated by Bears fans. I do still believe he's a good player. The reason I think he's a good player is because he kind of does everything, just a little bit of everything. And when he's on the field, it's not like you know exactly what play the Bears are going to run. I'm not as concerned about DeAndre Swift and Roshan Johnson, who I still believe Roshan Johnson is going to be a good player in the NFL. I think he played running back for two years, was a quarterback before that, and then he got stuck behind B. John Robinson at Texas. Ultimately, I think you're going to hear Roshan Johnson's name a lot next year, and I think he's going to have some big games. My main concern with the Chicago Bears and where I think they're going to lose a little bit of a, that, that, that rushing offense is, is the center and, and the right tackle. I, I'm, I'm still concerned about Ryan Bates or Coleman Shelton, and I'm still concerned about Nate Davis. The interior of the Bears offensive line to me is they're probably the biggest weekend on the weakness on their offense. And Tevin Jenkins, who's a great guard, we know is one of the best guards in football when he's healthy, he misses games as well. He's, he's often injured. So it, there, there's a good chance that all three of the interior offensive line positions for the Bears can be very weak at some point next year. That's where I think the Bears are going to get hurt in the rushing game. I don't think they're going to be able to run the ball up the middle. They're going to have to run to the edge. It's good that they signed DeAndre Swift because I think he's better around the edges than he's up in the middle. But ultimately, I don't see that there's any way and chance that they, they can match those numbers from last year. First of all, once Caleb Williams gets more comfortable, you'd like to see the Bears throw the ball a little bit more than they did last year, right? I mean, I, for, I think every Bears fan in the world is comfortable saying they don't want to see a single screen pass for the rest of their lives, right? That's so right. hopefully they'll be trying to move the ball downfield rather than from side to side. But it's 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 the Bears' offensive line really that I'm, that concerns me the most, and we've talked about this time and time again on this on this podcast, guys. It's it's Ryan Bates and Nate Davis that I think are going to be a big part of the reason that the Bears are not as strong of a rushing team. Yeah, and they, and they were project. I think it was ESPN Fantasy has them as a unit, not in the, any individual player ranked in the top five rushing units in the league. Um, Brian, is there a player that you think on that rush on on that on this roster? Is there a running back that you don't think makes this roster? Uh, Travis Homer. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, relevant. Uh, <laughs> You know what's really Khalil interesting, Herbert's, guys? Khalil Herbert's solid. Uh, Foreman, or not Foreman, uh, which is uh, Roshan Johnson. He's solid. He's going to be – he's the change of pace. Um, and Swift is essentially – I mean, he's going to catch a lot of balls out of the backfield, um, I think. Yeah. I mean, he's going to catch some screen passes that we're all going to hate to see, like yeah. Kyle said. But, uh, well, I, mean, up right now. Well. Well, I mean, those three are just – I mean, they're going to be heavy hitters. Um, I – I don't know if Travis Homer is going to – I mean, obviously, I don't know if he's going to make the team. If he does, it's going to be specifically just play special teams. Um, the um, – I don't know. I mean, it's – I mean, I, I just – I, I, like Kyle, so uh, the interior of the offensive line is going to make that running game. Um, 
I don't know if it's going to be a good thing if they bring Connor Williams in for a look. Um, I think it – because I don't know what they're seeing out of Ryan Bates or Shelton. I mean, it's it's one of them things like they're seeing more than we are. So if they don't bring him in, does that mean that the other two guys are playing really well? <laughs> or if they don't bring him in, are they just missing the, missing the mark there? Um, I don't know where to look at that. Um, as far as the um, running game, it's, I mean, I think it's going to be is what it is at this point. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's, re- oh, it's really interesting. Yeah, it's, it's like uh, I came across this when I was just looking up certain stats. Um, when it came to yards per attempt, the top guy was Justin Fields with 6.9. Can you guys guess who number two was? And it was, I think he only got like 50 yards, but yards per attempt. It was Vilas Jones. And so, so there are different ways to be able to get a little bit. Listen, I'm not a fan. I would have cut, I would have cut him probably two years ago. Or whatever. Well, I think you'll see Roma Dunes that kind of fill that role this year. There are ways, yeah, there are ways to get some yards. And to be honest with you, for me, one of my favorite players has been Tevin Jenkins. You know, from putting highlight videos together, it is very, very few and far between that I get an opportunity to even be able to make a highlight reel on a lineman. Man, I loved making some highlight footage videos of Tevin Jenkins because that guy's got a motor like no other. I mean, he plays through the whistle. He's constantly pushing guys downfield, out of bounds. That uh, I love me some Tevin Jenkins, and I truly believe that you know health is his biggest crutch. But you can run behind that man. Oh, you you totally. He will open up some holes for you. So I think as long as it's done right, they can still do it. But I mean. Yeah, it's going to be an interesting thing because the whole running game is is go, has, has to shift now that we don't have a super mobile quarterback. You know what I mean? So it's going to be different, and I think that's going to be interesting to see what that's like. Yeah, we also – I do want to mention we also have an offensive coordinator who wasn't heavy run. I mean, he, he was I, – I forget where he's ranked in, in the league, but I think his pass-to-rush ratio is like 60-40. I know that he's – much bigger on throw. I mean, he did have a really banged up offensive line last year in Seattle, but I know he is, he's much bigger on throwing the ball. And I'm sure that's half the reason he took the job here is he, he knew, he probably ultimately knew that Caleb Williams was going to be his project. Right. So I think they're going to rush the ball less regardless of yards, like regardless of how good the running backs play and yards. I think they're going to have less rushing attempts this year for sure. So I guess it depends upon what 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 does Swift do with it, and then I'm not 100 percent sold that Khalil Herbert's going to be on this roster day one, guys. I don't know. Brad Biggs has mentioned a couple of times that he will be f- competing for a job, and I just don't know. Uh, you're probably going to come to a point where you have to decide whether or not Bayless Jones or Khalil Herbert's worth being on this roster, right? Well, Khalil Herbert. Sure. I would imagine, no, but yeah. I don't know with the kickoff rule being relevant. Are you okay with going forward with just Swift and Roshan? And the Khalil Herbert, the biggest issue I think they have with Khalil Herbert, and the, the why I say this and why Brad Biggs wrote the article was he's not a pass protector. He's just not. And and as well as he's carried the ball because he has, if you look at his his average yards per carry over his career, I think it's still over four, but he just cannot seem to protect his quarterback, which is something they're going to be very focused on this season, right? Does make it obvious when he's out there what you're trying to do. That, yeah, that's true. That is true for sure. Yeah, and I, and and I think there's plays where you know Justin Fields had the RPO options. There's plays where Fields was probably it was probably drawn up to run the ball, and and Herbert found himself in pass protection, and he just got killed. I mean, let's be honest. I think I think he's had two major injuries in his career, and I believe one of them was suffered trying to block for his quarterback. So. I don't know that he's a guaranteed shoe in on this roster. Like like Paul said before the season started, it's going to be really hard to make this team. And I don't know if you lose – if Kyler Herbert doesn't make this this roster, I don't know if the Bears miss a beat. I don't know if that really affects them overall because, let's be honest, I mean, I, I, if, if, you have, if you suffer an injury with Swift or Roshan on, at, at that position, you can probably just go sign – I mean, how many running backs played for the Bears last year? Four? Darian Evans, Dante Foreman, Dante Foreman, sorry, Roshan Johnson, Cleo Herbert. I mean, it seems like a position that the Bears don't really 
Beyond DeAndre Swift getting the money that he got, I don't think they're going to stress who's back there too much as long as Caleb Williams is throwing the ball comfortably. But I don't know. I don't want to make any speculation. I'm, I'm not – I would not say right now today that, that Khalil Herbert is a guaranteed player on this Bears roster come 2024. What about a blasting game? He is one of they, the Bears. They so they just I forget which writer was. Is he was a fullback? Is he listed yeah. as fullback? So yeah, and the Bears just did a. They just I forget which writer it was. Man, he's a Bears writer. Just did a seven players that we might not see on the Bears next year. Clear Herbert was on the list. So I mean, was Blake, you have Blaise three Blaise tight Blaise. ends too, right? Bayless Jones was on the list. Dominique Robinson was on the list. Um, Larry Borum was on the list. I don't think there was. A tight end because I mean they signed no no I'm just saying if you have three tight ends because I'm pretty sure you have you know Komet Everett and yeah, Lewis most babies, yeah. you, you don't okay so then the fall fullback as well like that's a little bit too many roster spots yeah, usually good. typically if you, you you have more depth at tight end you don't have the fullback that's the position they cut to allow more depth at tight end so that's why I was just saying they they have three guys at tight end they seem like they're going to keep I would think the fullback gets cut before Khalil Herbert personally, but yeah, yeah that, oh, for, sure, for, sure, for sure. And they were, like I said, they were both on the list. And I don't know. I think it comes down to how many wide receivers do the bears want on this roster? Do they want Bayless Jones and Tyler Scott to both be on the active roster week in and week out? Do they want, you said, are you looking at how DJ like, Moore? I, I, I know I spoke positively about Bayless Jones, but honestly, like my take on him. Yeah, no, I think he he's the head on the chopping block right now. Like that's the guy. He's literally one mistake away, probably. Isn't yeah. it? You see and him fumble think, one more time, it's it's over. It's done. So you can him. give him opportunities, but he's gotta he, they, he's gotta like shine him. with him in order to overcome and they signed him. Ian Wheeler, who was actually a running back as well, but that's not what he's gonna be on the roster. But they signed Ian Wheeler, who was a return specialist specialist in college. So you better believe if like you're absolutely right, Paul, if Bayless makes those mistakes in the preseason. Dropping the balls, he's gone. He's gone. There's just no way he makes this roster, right? There's no way he makes this. No matter how relevant the kickoff is now, there's no way he makes this roster. Um, moving on, guys, from that subject, I do want to harp a little bit more about Caleb Williams, and I, I want to ask you guys, do you think we went over the last uh, – Paul, you were in the chat a whole lot. Do you think Caleb Williams – affects whether or not this like how much do you think Caleb Williams playing within the system versus Caleb Williams playing the hero ball that Caleb Williams has played basically his entire career as a quarterback plays into the Bears making the playoffs oh well I, I don't think he plays that much hero ball to be honest with you I think that's what the highlights mostly consist of and I know because I've put them together but I love his pro day and if you look at the uh, prime podcast with Ryan Clark they sit there and they kind of touch on it where they said hey you went out there on your pro day, and your first pass was this like flashy rollout, like it, like right before you get to the sideline, you throw it, and you, and they're like after that you stayed boring all day, did all the little touch uh, touch throws and this and that. They're like, are you trolling? Like, and he's like, yeah, a little bit. Like this is what I, it, all the videos of me are, but don't think that I can't go out there and do what I need to do. Like playing within the system is is huge, and I think when the system breaks down. He's capable of playing that hero ball. And so, you know, um, I asked my friend this the other day, too, because uh, like you guys are the Chicago Sports Network, right? So I, I told him, like, how how good really is the triangle offense? Or is it the fact that everybody just bought in to the triangle offense and everybody's on the same page that you can then start succeeding and have another level of success. So I think it kind of mimics some of the things in the NFL too. It's like, there's a lot of different systems, a lot of different ways to win. But I mean, when it comes to, you know, offense, like you're looking at Sean McVay and that whole tree. And I think like 90% of the league tries to do what he's doing, you know? And so it's not that different. It's all about being on the same page, understanding everything and if it breaks down, still coming out with a positive play, not a negative play. So, um, yeah, I, th I think the uh, impact the quarterback could potentially have is giant. And if Caleb Williams is everything that he's supposed to be, I think we will see something we have not seen in Chicago for, I mean, my lifetime. 
So, so I guess what, I, what I'm kind of at, because we have this ESPN prediction of 3,500 yards, 23 touchdowns, 13 interceptions. It's a, it's, a, it's a moderate season, guys, for a guy who's drafted first overall, two team that won seven games. How good does Caleb have to be for this Bears team to win 10 or 11 games to make the playoffs? Because they're in a tough division, right? Yeah, so, so I kind of made this point, um, I think, last time I was on, because it's like you can get stats to say anything you want, right? I'll tell you that uh, uh, Cam Newton's rookie season, he had over 4,000 yards passing, 700 yards rushing. You know, they had um, – D'Angelo Williams, Jonathan Stewart, Greg Olson, Jeremy Shockey. They, you know, they, they had a lot of good players on the team. They won, they won six and ten. So, okay, so that's cute. All those numbers are great. Like, is that – is what do you want? Do you want the wins or do you want the numbers? Because, like I said, if all you want is wins, and I love how you guys kind of touched on that, like the numbers might not matter at the end of the day as long as you're winning. No, they won't matter, and as long as you're smart enough – as a player, which Caleb will be, to just not let the media harp on you or whatever. This and that. I don't care if you go out there and throw for 100 yards a game. If we're winning every game, it's when you're losing every game that you start to sit there and dissect those things and, and find issues with it and this and that. So, like, like yards, I'll be a little bit on. <laughs> right, right. No, but what I'm saying is, like, right, you don't know how, exactly the dynamic of this team yet. So, like, if the special teams this year are more elevated and can put the defense in a better spot and can put the offense in a better spot and this and that, we may see lower yardage. I just want it to still come with wins. So like 3,500 yards, whatever, whatever, cool. Like you said, the touchdown number then seems a little low to me because if that, num if that number plays out the way it's, it's written and my expectation of wins still has to be implied to it, then I think you probably have more touchdowns. Yeah, or they're running the you know ball. I mean? well. Right, yeah. or they're running the ball a lot or this and that. But, like, um, situationally, I could see that being a realistic stat. But, like, no, to me, the number one thing is for sure wins. Like, I, I don't care. And I don't care if he has to throw for 4,000-plus yards. Yeah, that's and, kind of my And, and like, so, so, like, the NFL, team. that's not unheard of. That's, like, the well, norm. Well, We're right. afraid to even – get near it it's sad we're all scarred man we really are <laughs> right how good does caleb have to be for the bears to make the playoffs uh with this team um i think he has to be i mean top 75 percent of the league honestly um i mean he, he's gotta get that ball to them receivers i mean they stock them receivers they're gonna use them uh if they can't use them it's because Caleb Williams can't get on the ball or the offensive line's not protecting. Uh, he has to be, I mean, you know, top two thirds of the league. I mean, it's, uh, I don't see any way that, you know, they can just run the ball to death or whatever with these receivers. And uh, I mean, I think uh, Roma Dunze is a good blocker. Uh, DJ Moore's a good blocker, but they ain't going to get that far. Um, the new kickoff rule is intriguing. I don't know how that's going to manipulate the numbers at all. Um, if at all, <laughs> you know, I mean, it can do absolutely nothing. Uh, I mean, can, uh, Canada abandoned this rule at one year after they had it, <laughs> I think, or, uh, you know, so, I mean, they didn't even believe in it. So I don't know why the NFL even adopted it to begin with. Uh, that's a different topic though. <laughs> so, but, uh, I really think he's gotta, he's gotta pass the ball, um, and, um, get it to these receivers that they paid so much money for. I mean, if he doesn't, then they're not going to go to the playoffs. Kyle, I'm going to ask you the same question, but and I want to focus a little more. How how important will it be that Caleb Williams just doesn't make the same mistakes Justin Fields made? Uh, Dustin said Caleb needs to make winning plays. Justin Fields obviously played his worst, worst football at the most pivotal points in the game. He had the worst pass rating in the fourth quarter of all quarterbacks in the NFL. How important is it that Caleb just doesn't make the mistakes that all the Bears quarterbacks we've watched in the past have made? Uh, really, Brendan, that's the answer to your first question. <laughs> How well does Caleb have to play for us to make the playoffs? He just basically doesn't – just don't lose us games. I mean, you guys, we've seen – we saw Mitch Trubisky make the playoffs. He didn't have some phenomenal season. I think he threw 26 touchdowns that year. It was nothing crazy. It, all, it ultimately is up to the Bears' defense and running game. If the Bears' defense is, is as good as they were to finish the season last year and they allow an average of 17 points a game or less – and Caleb Williams just has to make a few plays a game to 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 be a winning quarterback. That's it. I don't think he has to go out there and be miraculous. I don't think he, he needs to be C.J. Stroud from last year. He just has to not screw it up, right? I mean, and if if the Bears want to ease him into the offense and let him get get it accumulated accumulated slowly, 
then basically he, he, you know, 100, I would say, if you have to put numbers on it, if you have to put numbers on it, 150 yards a game, two touchdowns, I think this team could be winning, a winning team. I think they could win 10 games. But, like, Dustin's right. He cannot do what Justin Fields did in the fourth quarter of games last year. He can't. I want to ask you guys another question because we, we kind of hard, we went through the like, – and, um, Paul, you were watching that, that episode where we went through the Bears, the DraftKings predictions. Which it's DraftKings, so we'll – Yep. I'll take that with a grain of salt. We went through game by game. And we were talking an awful lot about Caleb Williams and the offense. And I do kind of what you just said. The compliment that that Caleb really has outside of the receiving core and the weapons that they've put around this team is, is the way the defense finished last year. And I, I, I want to remind everybody who's watching the show, guys, and thanks for everybody. We have over 70 in the viewers or over 70 in the chat, guys. Thank you. Thanks for everybody who's staying active, who's who's following along. I'm sure we would see Bear Ski in there if he wasn't sitting here on the show with us. I do want to ask you guys all this. I'll start with you, Paul. The Bears play seven out of eight quarterbacks drafted in the first round in the last two seasons. Okay, so you have J.J. McCarthy. You have Jaden Daniels. You have Drake May. You have Bryce Young. You have Anthony Richardson. You have um, – uh, who am I leaving out? Um, Will Levis. The guy. The only guy they don't play is Will Mix, drafted in the first round over the last two years. That's the only quarterback they won't play. Now, will J.J. McCarthy and Drake May play when they play the Bears? I don't know, but there's there's a chance they will, right? How important is it – How how important is the Bears' defense versus the Bears' offense to their their success in 2024? Playing a bunch of inexperienced head – and I also want to point out, guys, five new head coaching staff, five new coaching staffs out of – I believe there was 11 teams that made changes at coaching, and the Bears play half of them. So how much do you think the defense um, – um, 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 is the defense more important than the offense in the 20, in the six, regarding the success of the 2024 season? Real quick, before I answer that, I just kind of want to address chat. Justin, jo- uh, Dustin Jones said 150 yards a game. No, that's not winning football in the modern NFL. You'll find no example of it, but we do have an example of it because last year we saw this team win seven games with a quarterback whose ceiling seemed to be 200 yards per game. Like Justin Fields struggled to throw for 300. So I think we're talking about a floor. Like as long as this game is purely passing and you're, you're passing the ball, yeah, like I don't want to see you dip below that. Of course, I want to see you do better than 150 yards a game. But I think we're talking about, like, the floor minimum, the worst. And so so I just wanted to kind of clear that up because it's like, yeah, it's not a winning uh, formula in the NFL if you do it for 17 weeks in a row. Of course, but you don't – but 150 and two touchdowns, that's – it's so where you want to be at least, right? Yeah, like at first, minimum. The first overall pick of the draft, they're probably the expectation's gonna be high for him. We all know that. But as long as like Kyle and you and you just said, Paul, no, if he puts touchdowns on the board versus interceptions versus fumbles, that's yeah. gonna be the difference in how we how we judge Caleb Williams moving forward, right? Does he make more winning plays than mistakes? And that's something we we unfortunately guys, and I'm not disrespecting the guy, we we didn't see that with Justin Fields, especially towards the end of football games. No, it's, it's not a stat thing. What's that, Brian? I said they got to fear his arm. Uh, they didn't fear Justin Fields' arm. I mean, if they, if at the end of the day you could say Caleb Williams, the, just the fear that he instilled in the other defense made them take eight out of the box and allow us to run the ball, and he only got 150 yards, then that's winning football. My co-host said it the best during the season last year where we were doing a podcast. At one point, he goes, you know what? It's kind of funny. At the end of the day, we're seeing the same thing we saw with Mitch Trubisky from these opposing defenses. They're just saying, well, let's just make this guy play football. Mm -hmm. Let's make him play the quarterback position. You know what I mean? Let's take that stuff away and this and that. And, like, the the league adjusted to Justin Fields. He was – I was – more high on him in 2022 than I was in 2023. But Brandon, to answer your question, what's more important, the defense or the offense? Well, me personally, this is why the draft kind of intrigues me because I want to say the defense, but then they went ahead and picked Rome with pick nine. So if you're kind of setting this thing up where you might expect the offense to have to carry this thing a little bit, if not, why wouldn't you have gotten – uh, pass rusher of your choice. Like I said, you could have dro- dropped back. You cannot convince me there's not going to be one defensive stud out there, right? Like, uh, okay, I get not making the right choice or whatever, but you can't you can't say that all the defensive players this year are going to suck. No, there's going to be several out there, whatever. You could have dropped back, gained more draft capital for the future, still went off, gotten a, a prime defensive end, 
an opposing Montez Sweat, a guy like Jared Verse or Talos Turner, I mean, what, at least we're looking at seven, eight plus sacks, whereas now having Romo Dunze in wide receiver three. Now, like I said, I understand this a little bit more looking long term with the way the contracts are shaping up for wide receivers and this and that. So, so I get it. But when it comes to this year, like, what do you expect from Romo Dunze? What, five, six, seven hundred yards? <laughs> At most, which is not as not as impactful as seven, eight sacks would have been, in my opinion, from another defensive end opposing Montez Sweat. So, like, what's more important? I mean, I would have said defense, but I'm just going to tell you I don't know because I'm kind of a little confused by – I'm sure they know, but maybe it's just they're trying to be very well balanced. But, um, man, it should be the defense. They're the ones that are that are more solidified, I feel. And, and somebody told me something once too that I always go by that it's so much harder to build something, but so much easier to tear it down. At the end of the day, the defense, all it has to do is tear you down. And that can be a lot easier of a, a thing to be, you know, have on their plates than it is to build a very effective, well-oiled machine on offense. So just, just just real quick guys, Dustin, once again, we're talking about, his his floor for one game. We're not talking about if not, Caleb Williams comes out every single game, throws 150 yards and two touchdowns. The Bears are going to be 15 and, and two. I'm just saying, in a, in a specific game, if the Bears defense, like I said, for just one, two, whatever, however many games this happens, that the Bears allow 10 points because their defense is playing so well, like it was at the end of last year. If he has 150 yards and two touchdowns, and then they have rushing touchdowns, and the Bears win 21 to 10. I'm fine with that. I don't need him to throw 350 yards in that single game. Now, obviously, towards the end of the season, if you take his 17-game season average, yes, you'd like him to be above, well above 200 yards a game. But if it's a game like the Minnesota Vikings was last year, just don't fumble twice in the fourth quarter. That's, That's what, what we're is talking consistency about. Consistency <laughs> is huge, though, man. I can almost say if you do give me a 150 and two touchdowns every week, and I know that and I can guarantee that, Oh man, I, I could probably win most of my games. It's the fact that, like, okay, sure, you'll get me three, three fifty, but what, two interceptions? So is that a good game? Like you're, the yardage increase, but like if you're yeah. turning the ball over, you might yeah. lose that. Yeah, you know, so it, 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 like I said, the stats are funny, man. He makes a good point saying nine of the top ten teams that led in the league yards per game last year. I think he means passing yards per game last year. We're in the playoffs. The tenth team on that list. So of the ten teams, nine out of the men that made the playoffs, the tenth team averaged two thirty eight. So do the Bears need to average more than 238 yards to be a playoff team passing? No. Is that the way that it plays out? I mean, I believe that in the, in the, in the, in the NFL that we that we we are accustomed today, guys, the NFL we're watching today, I would expect somewhere around 215. I, that's what I – if Caleb can throw around 215 yards a game, you've got yourself a oh, modern I mean – Brandon, Paul, did you guys look at what, what, what was what was what was Mr. Trubisky's per game average in 2008 or what was that 18 when the Bears went to the playoffs? What was what did he average per game? How many yards Dude, did Mr. Trubisky I, I, average per I'll game? I'll tell you, Patrick Mahomes' yards per game has actually decreased every year. Yeah, what was he hasn't gotten Trubisky? worse. He Mr. Trubisky's that year they was are, probably what uh, two five two oh five a game probably that year. Right, and the Bears, the Bears won what twelve games that year. Yep. I'm, yep. I'm not saying that Kilo Williams, I want him to throw 150 yards and not make any mistakes. He I'm threw, saying he threw 30 yards. He threw 30 yards. We had a game that was 12 to 30, nine against yeah. the Vikings. We had a game against the Packers where we only put up nine points. Listen, I don't, I don't care about the hundred yards. I care when it comes. <laughs> like, uh, like a hundred uh, yards in those situations would have made the world a difference. So, yeah. You're also, Kyle, you're, Kyle, you're also kind of making the point, though, that the last time the Bears made the playoffs was the highest yards per game average the quarterback. All right, but what, what, how many yards was it? I, it? I think I'm reading this wrong because I'm looking at his stats right now on NFL.com, and it says this has got to be his total. Yeah, I don't know. Let me, let me look for his per game because it's showing me his totals for the year. Well, just take his total yards and then divide it by how many games he played. It's probably 16 back then, wasn't it? Yeah, I think that year it was still 16. So however many yards he threw, so 32, whatever, and divide it by 16 games. He threw it's 32. Oh, it's 200. Yeah, I mean, man, this is just... 200, 200, 230. He threw an average of 230 yards per game. 
Okay, so if that's if that's what he needs to average, Caleb Williams, that's fine. So one game he'll have 320 yards against some garbage tomato can defense, and then the next game he'll have 150 yards and two touchdowns against a really good defense. But the Bears can still win the game if their defense allows seven points. That's that's the point we're trying to make. It's I'm not when I'm at the end of every game. If the Bears are in the fourth quarter and they're tied, and the end at the end of the game. And it's 31 31 with two minutes left. I'm not going to go to Caleb Williams' stat line and go, well, you know what? So the, so the yardage is why they're tied. I'm going to go, you know what? The reason they didn't win this game already is because of those two interceptions right there. Or the reason they're still in this game is because of those four touchdown passes right there. I don't care how many yards he threw. It doesn't matter to me. I don't even so, care if the Bears' defense outscores their offense. It well, doesn't let matter. Me, let, me, let me ask this question then, Brian. I'll ask it this way Is the, the points per game allowed by the defense, is that going to be more important than the points per game scored by the offense? A hundred percent. I don't think there's uh, any scenario where that's not uh, I me mean, as far as uh, uh, our defense goes. Uh, we got corners for days. I'm, I'm um, talking about the Bears specifically because there are teams in the NFL like like Paul yeah. alluded to earlier, like that Browns defense was good enough to have Joe Flacco, who threw 300-some yards a game, I think, but – they didn't score. I don't think they scored a whole. I think they averaged like 24 points a game. And they were still winning football games because they had the best defense in the NFL. So is yeah. that the situation the Bears are going to be in in 2024 where you're, you're you're just scoring enough as long as your defense can contain? I think you have to count on that um, as far as having a rookie cor- uh, quarterback. I mean, you have to expect that whether he proves differently. Um, it would be great, you know, if he proves that, you know, he puts up 30 points a game and you're still only allowing 15. I mean, that'd be awesome. Um, as far as the, uh, the back to the other thing, as far as the 150 yard at, uh, floor, you know, you, with that hunter, <laughs> you give out 150 yard floor, <laughs> they're winning every game, you know, um, it's, um, but, um, I, I would anticipate the Bears defense just being relentless. They're, they're going to come in there they're going to plan on stifling every team that they face. And then, you know, whatever they get out of Caleb Williams still, it proves to be consistent one way or the other determines whether or not they can let up. I mean, I have to go for more interceptions. Yeah, more and, you're, and you're really looking at, so I guess, cause, cause we guys, we both, we all know that their weakest units on both sides of the ball, their trenches, right. Their defensive line, their offensive line. So you're looking at the Bears really strong secondary and I, I have a lot there's a lot of people ranking the Bears secondary outside of the top 10 like 12 to 14. It's ludicrous. I, I think their top five unit the, the secondary I really believe between Kyle Gordon, Jaquan Brisker, um, Jalen Johnson, S- Stevenson let's let's even just leave Byard out of this and see how he performs I still think you're looking at the top five unit so you're looking at that unit versus the opposing offense and then you're looking at Adunze and Keenan Allen and and DJ Moore versus the opposing defense which unit that did on defense or the offensive side of the ball, which one makes a bigger difference in regards to them making a, a, a having a playoff season, right? You know, it's interesting. Real quick, with the projections that were made, 3,500 yards. Well, guess what, guys? 3,500 yards over 17 games is 205 yards a game. Yep. So, okay, so if you want to hit that mark, it's 205 yards a game. Now, that's if you stay healthy all 17 games, right? If you miss a couple games and you still want to hit that mark, then you're talking about a little bit of an increased average. But just want to throw that out there. So in order to get 3,500 yards for the season, like projected, it is 205. Kyle, Kyle, what do you think? He's going to be good telling of that, too, week one. Kyle, because they, you, they're supposed to have good corners. Kyle, what do you think the Bears' identity is if they're a playoff team this year? Are they the team? Are we looking at them like they're the Cleveland Browns or the New York Jets, like from last year, the team that's just going to start from scoring points, or are they the, the Joe well, Burrow bank? For the first time in my life, Brian, I'd like their identity to be balanced, a balanced football team, both good on offense and defense. I don't think I've, in our lifetime we've ever really seen that. I mean, it's, even when the Bears had their best defensive seasons, their offense was not good. The, the identity I'd like to see is is – it's balanced, but if you're asking me personally, I am still. I'm an old-fashioned football fan. I was born in '88. I've been. I've watched a lot of football in my life. I watched every highlight of the '85 Bears you could possibly think of. To me, defense wins championships. I believe that the reason the Kansas City Chiefs won the Super Bowl last year is ultimately because of their defense, not their offense. Now, obviously, Patrick Mahomes is the biggest part of the biggest gear in the machine, like the biggest part of the equation. But if, the man, the way Chris Jones and, and those guys played at the end of last season, and especially in the in the second half of every playoff game, and I don't know if they allowed a point last year in the second half of the playoffs. I mean, it, that's ultimately what won the Chiefs Super Bowl. I still believe that defense wins championships, and I still think believe that tre- the, the trenches is where football is won. 
to be to piggyback off that um uh i don't gamble much but my co-host likes to partake and he when the playoffs started he's like man he's like this is easy money and i was like what is he's like uh patrick mahomes rushing total on the over every playoff game he's like this guy is so smart he spends the entire season not really running and when it comes time when it's do or die he will rush and get that first down on his own more so, more often than he would during the season he will put himself at risk of getting injured cuz the damn playoffs like he's like every single game patrick mahomes on the rushing over and like like i said patrick mahomes rush uh pass yards per game have actually gone down over the years why cuz he's actually been gotten smarter and learned to trust his guys a little bit more and spread the ball around a little bit better and i mean and, and then take what the defense gives you too. You know what I mean? So, so it's it, when it's time to run, it's time to run. Like, it's not about you just having to pass all the time. It's not always on you. It's not always about big plays. Just get the damn first down, keep the chains moving this mm-hmm. and that, and let's win a football game. You know what I mean? Uh, I'm one man where like, I saw this transition happen in front of me. A lot of my good friends, the, when red zone came about, no, first it started with fantasy football. I remember my friend's little brother sitting there in front of the p- computer refresh 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 oh i got another two points refresh refresh because it was like 2010 2011 and me and my buddy which is his brother were just making fun of him like dude you're obsessed okay well then red zone is introduced i look at everybody and everybody's obsessed all they want to see is touchdown score 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 touchdown meanwhile i'm one who's gone to games and i appreciate the roller coaster ride that a full game puts you through and i've been at games where all it is is a field position paddle all game one of the best games I went to was in 2018 when we won 15 or nine against Jared Goff and the Rams. There's so high energy and it was all field goals that game. And so like that stuff matters, it matters a lot. There's a lot of little details that matter when it comes to winning a football game. Now, if you want to just put up numbers, if you want to just put up stats, that's a whole nother conversation, you know, but, but it's interesting because you got to win. You got to win. And like like you said about the Kansas City Chiefs defense, man, I point to that one play with Zay Flowers where he stretches out to the end zone to try and get a touchdown, and it becomes a fumble, touchback, other team. Gets, so instead of you getting seven points, now the other team has the ball. Why? Because you stretched it out an inch. Listen, rookie, it's not all on you. Fucking just – if you would have not tried that, dab down, then you're at the one – or at the inch, like it's such, and we're talking about just a small, small mistake. And like, this is why this is the ultimate team sport, man. It matters. So yeah, it, it's interesting. The fantasy line on, on Caleb Williams rushing yards right now is 232 rushing yards on the season, four fumbles. I don't know if, if that's a betting line, I'd take the over on that. Oh, 100%. Days. That's definitely over. Yeah, he's going to rush over 232 yards. He's going to probably, I'm guessing between three He'll to five have Kevin. <laughs> um, guys, I, I do want to give a shout out again to everybody in our chat. We had Cliff, Dustin, Antmas, Bruja. Um, I saw a couple new names too, guys. Let me scroll back a little bit. Okay, maybe I didn't. Sorry. Um, oh, yeah, Damon Dice, um, Gregory Stevens, guys. Thanks for joining us tonight. Uh, thanks for joining Chicago Sports Podcast. I do want to thank. Everybody in the chat and all of our sponsors, Bridges Scoreboard, Serendipity Ice Cream, um, TC's World of Wonders, River Street, and uh, Budget Cars, oh, we're Stadium Club. And I want to give a big thanks, guys, to my co-host, as always, Brian, Kyle, thanks for joining me. It's always fun to hash it out. And a very special thanks to a guy who I'd usually read the name of in our chats, Bersky, and that is Paul. Paul, pleasure having you on tonight, man. Yeah, man, and I just wanted to thank you guys again so much for having me on and, uh, you know, uh, letting me take up as much time as I did with all my talks and thoughts and whatnot. But, yeah, you you guys definitely have love for my channel. So just like for everybody in the chat and everybody out there, youtube.com slash film. Got a lot of great highlight films and hype videos and this and that. And hopefully during the season, man, I would love for you guys to to come on my show um, and talk some football too. So I'll definitely be extending an olive branch out there and – be in contact with you guys. But yeah, tonight was awesome. You guys are great, smart, smart football fans. And uh, I had a great experience here tonight. So thank you so much. Thanks yeah, a lot, guys, Paul. Thank you. Definitely go, go check out Paula Bersky's film, guys. I, I Like I said, I was, like, I was very late alerted that I was going to be hosting the show. I did go watch some of your videos, man. Very, very, very interesting stuff. I love the film, man. 
love the film. I, I get why it's Bearski film. I love the film. And, and yeah, man. So, man, if you're Bearski because I'm a, I'm Polish, man. Me and my co-host. Yeah, I, so I figured once you told us yeah. that. Yeah, but yeah, sure, no. If we, ever, if, we got, if we got room and time for us, man, give us a shout out. I'll definitely always, always we, for we, sure. We will, Thank you. We will for sure have you on this show again. And please, please, man, keep keep living it up in the in the comment section because, like I said, you always move the conversation forward when we find ourselves a little stagnant. On that note, guys, I do want to thank everybody out there for giving yourselves or giving your your Wednesday night to us, the Chicago Sports Podcast. I do want to give a big shout out to the man, Brandon Trax, Chicago Sports Podcast CEO and founder, um, for giving us an opportunity to speak with somebody like Paul and just get the hash out bears, guys. And uh, yeah, for everybody out there, don't be too concerned about this Caleb Williams, Roma Dunze stuff. It'll get itself worked out. Ryan Poles does his thing. He will again. And uh, I just want to say thanks for everybody for watching and enjoy the rest of your Wednesday. Everybody have a good rest of your week, honestly. Um, thank you, Paul. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Kyle. Um, thank fair you. Down, town.